I had a very strange babysitting experience the other night. Everything was normal until the kids were in bed. One of the kids kept running around, but finally they were down. And so I was just scrolling through random videos on Instagram to pass the time. I was watching one and I heard something. It was like a man or one of the boys pretending to have a deep voice was upstairs. It just said, no, or something like that in this weird, crowly voice. I was confused and a little spooked, but I brushed it off and sat on the couch to watch a movie. Their dog was walking around and growling at the windows that led to the backyard. That creeped me out too, but I tried to brush that off. I thought maybe the dog had seen a squirrel or something. At this point, it's about 10 p.m. The dog was laying on my lap and started growling and barking toward the kitchen. At this point, I was like, you better cut that out because who on earth wouldn't be creeped out by that? Later, I heard these incredibly light, whispery voices, like children. I wasn't completely sure if it was just the kids waking up and making noises, but it only lasted a moment after I noticed. I didn't even have time to go up and check. I noticed all these weird things, but I didn't really put them all together until later that night. I talked to my mom, and she told me that my sister and her friend had babysat there as well and they both had odd experiences. Bad vibes, the kid telling her she'd seen some things, and the kids actually addressing something that wasn't there. My mom didn't tell me before I went over so that I wouldn't be spooked, which I guess was good, because I got an independent witness of whatever happened without being influenced by the experiences of others. Anyway, I'll still go back to babysit, I'll just be prepared to throw hands with Casper if I have to, I guess. I've been backpacking and camping, mostly solo, as an adult, for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer and move through the land with little impact. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and obscure, cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained. I've read most of the missing 411 cases and am a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find, anything strange that will fire the imagination, there have been occasions where I have felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I have been out in the woods, but mostly I've chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters which others experience. I look for logical conclusions first. I've never encountered any truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged, and if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you may live, I would suggest it. It's beautiful, serene, and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and poplar, and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks, following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail, which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring, looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. I eventually made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field meant that there had, I guessed at one point, been people living in the area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there, and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up tent 
and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together, loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl that I was in, loud enough that you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest, and anyone who's been out there knows that it is dark. I thought it had to be a person making the noise, because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud, and it would have taken considerable effort to produce. I'd seen nobody else at all during the day, and the direction from which the sound came was in the section of old growth that I had explored earlier. And that's it. Eventually the sound stopped, and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something I wasn't meant to hear. Or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone to hear. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen, but nothing did. I've told friends about this, and they'll either say it was for sure a Sasquatch, or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I just didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods, late at night, banging logs together in the dark? In May 2009, I had just broken up with my girlfriend of almost three years. We had moved from Calgary to Toronto, and we were still stuck living together after the breakup, as we didn't know many people in the city yet. Needless to say, the situation was pretty stressful and upsetting. So when a buddy I was going to school with at the time suggested a weekend camping and fishing trip, I jumped at the chance. He grew up in an area about an hour outside of Toronto, called Flamborough. It's really beautiful. Lots of lush forest, farmers, fields, some small rivers and creeks. We decided to camp and fish along a creek called Grindstone Creek. It's close to some wetlands and the fishing is supposed to be great. We ended up setting up our camp in what was probably a farmer's field. I'm guessing now that it was probably trespassing on our part, bordered by a gorgeous forest. We spent the evening fishing, shooting the breeze, and drinking some quality craft beer. As it got darker, we made a little fire and roasted potatoes and hot dogs. All in all, it was a really good night. We turned in just after midnight, and we shared a tent. My buddy fell asleep before me, and I stayed up playing on my phone until probably 1.30. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was being woken up by a high-pitched yipping type of noise. I was kind of groggy, and it took me a moment to fully wake up. The yipping was incessant, and it sounded like a weird coyote. I laid there for a moment, listening, and then I started playing on my phone again. The noise was really annoying. I tried ignoring it, but it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, it sounded like it had to be no more than 10 feet from the tent. At this point, I was getting a little unsettled. I had seen coyotes in Calgary before, and I thought of them as pretty harmless. They never looked much bigger than a smallish dog. But what if this one was rabbit or something? What if it could smell our food? I have a pretty bad anxiety disorder, so I'm prone to worrying about these types of things. I nudged my buddy to see if he was awake and he was. The noise had woken him up too. We discussed what to do about the coyote, as we hadn't brought anything to scare it off. No BB gun or anything. Finally, he decided he would shine the flashlight on it and holler a lot. Hopefully, that would scare it off. He unzipped the tent, and I watched him pointing the flashlight out into the darkness. I'll never forget what happened next. 
his legs suddenly went all wobbly, and he sort of stumbled backwards into the tent. He had a really dumbfounded look on his face. When he looked at me, he babbled, It's not a coyote, it's a dude, it's some weird dude. Normally I would have thought he was messing with me. I'm a huge wimp and I scare easily. I won't even watch horror movies, so I'm an easy target. But I've never seen somebody, especially him, look that scared. And I never want to see that expression on anybody's face again. So I knew he wasn't pulling my leg. The weird yipping and howling type noises were still going on. And in retrospect, it really didn't sound like a coyote. But I guess in our groggy states, it was a way for our brains to make sense of it. Anyway, he kept telling me just to look out the tent flap to make sure he wasn't crazy. At this point, I was having a full-blown anxiety attack. My heart was racing and I felt like crap, but I had to look. So I slowly peeked out the flap and waited for my eyes to adjust. And that's when I saw him. He was standing only a few arms lengths away from the tent. He was swaying a little and wearing a baseball cap. What made it awful though, what was really creepy, was that he was wearing women's lingerie. That's when I knew that there was most likely something very wrong with this guy. I mean, mostly because he was making high-pitched yips at strangers in tents in the middle of the night. I pulled my head back inside the tent, and my buddy and I discussed what to do. Finally, we decided to just swear at the guy. My buddy started yelling obscenities, saying to go away and we're trying to sleep in here, but with more obscenities. The noise stopped. It was dead silent. And that's when we heard footsteps running toward the tent. They stopped right outside of it, but we didn't waste any time. We started yelling again. We have cell phones in here. If you don't go away, we're going to call the cops. With that, we heard him walk by the tent and head off. It sounded like he was moving toward the road. Needless to say, we laid awake, petrified until the first sign of sunlight. And then we hightailed it out of there. We discussed her experience on the way home, and we're both pretty embarrassed about how scared we got. It definitely wasn't normal for either of us. I think because we were both ashamed of how we let some weirdo freak us out so much, we never really talked about it since. But either way, it was wild. I live alone, unless you want to include my cat, and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant had used it as a bedroom. Obviously, when I first moved in, I did go up there just to have a snoop around. There are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs, and one that is a long string that you pull which is right in the middle of the room. There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. After living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn off the light. So I go and do that. About two weeks on, I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. I can see the window to the room from outside and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, ugh, I've been robbed. I barge into my home, quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find someone, but there's no one there. Ah, they must still be up there, I thought. So I fly up the stairs and the door is shut, but the light is still on. I swing the door open, and nothing. I will say that I'm very skeptical about stories when I hear feeling of dread or felt I was being watched, but I had both of those. I had this horrific feeling that I really wasn't alone up there, but it's a simple empty box of a room. I try my best to shrug it off, I turn the light off, and I shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, 
I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic. Day or night, the light is on at least twice a week. But now, it switches itself off after a while. Recently, I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the attic window. So I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly, my cat, who is very tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could be because he's just out of sorts, but given the situation and the fact that he never hisses at anything ever, it really freaks me out. I've had a few experiences throughout my life, but this one tends to stand out. I was about 14 and I had been babysitting for a few couples for about three years already. Two of the couples were close friends and I would end up babysitting for both sets of their children. One had two and one had three children, ranging from 18 months to 10 years old. This particular night, I asked a friend of mine to assist so I do have a witness. The home we were in was in an older, beautiful two-story home with a full basement in a nice part of Tulsa around Swan Lake. The kids got rowdy when bedtime was mentioned, which is why I had my friend. They were in an upstairs room, the baby's room, jumping and laughing, and all of a sudden we heard three incredibly loud bangs from near the window on the second floor. Upon hearing this, I called out, and I told the kids that that was enough, having thought that it was one of them. It was then that I noticed that they were all frozen in their tracks, looking from the window to us. And one of them finally said, we didn't do it. No one had been by the window. It wasn't until a few years ago that I would mention this part when I told the story because I really didn't want to believe what I saw when I looked out. But there were two red eyes looking into the room from outside. I grabbed the baby and we nearly ran over each other getting out of the room and downstairs. My friend and I ran into the kitchen and grabbed steak knives. We were young and panicked and we huddled in the living room. First, we heard a loud crash then we heard something with loud, heavy steps, just pacing back and forth. The home had original hardwood floors, so it creaked. I had called my parents who were about 10 minutes away, no cell phones then, and I told them that there was someone in the house. My parents came and my dad went upstairs, my friend and I close behind. Of course, there was no one, but the weird thing we did notice was that the bedroom door to the right of the top stairs was open. We went in and the closet door was open and there was a curtain which was down, which had covered a very small window, about 18 by 12 inches, and that window was open. There were no trees, no ladders, no gables, no way to access this back side of the house upstairs, especially through that window. When the parents came home, we had told them what happened, and I proceeded to mention that I probably would not be comfortable babysitting there again. The next morning, my mom mentioned that she had heard about a 15-year-old boy who had lived with his stepmother. He had hung himself in that house but she didn't want to tell me because she didn't want me to be scared or imagine things. Thanks, Mom. Having heard this, it made me remember being in this house during previous times that I had babysat and other situations that occurred. One, the home had window units, and in the summertime, I found that there was always a cool breeze from the bottom to the top stair. I would always sit there and do my homework after the kids went to bed. At the top and bottom of the stairs, though, at least once you pass those points, 
it would be really hot and humid. Two, the downstairs had the living room back to a wall and stairs to the kitchen. I would sit on a settee with my back to the stairs, doing my homework, and suddenly feel somebody behind me. It always felt like it was a male presence, and I thought it was the father trying to sneak up and surprise me. I mean, I could hear his breathing and all. I would steel myself so that I wouldn't jump when he tried to surprise me, but then nothing would happen, and I would jerk around and see that nobody was there. Then I would just turn on the TV or something to occupy my mind, being a bit creeped out. Number three. This home has sold several times over the years. One time when I had been visiting town several years later, I had moved out of state, there was a midnight garage sale. I had to stop and talk to the current owners. Either them or the next owners ended up building a tall brick fence around the property, seemingly due to others knowing about this house and wanting to come and visit the haunted house. Finally, during another visit with an old boyfriend, we drove by and they were having an open house for sale again. We stopped and we were invited to go through. The home had been completely remodeled, beautiful with a decked out full basement. While we were ascending the stairs to the second floor, I was explaining to the agent and my friend that during the time that I had babysat in the home and during several visits thereafter, the weirdest thing was that there was approximately six locks on the attic door from the hallway, and I had never gone into the attic, because obviously. Right as I finished my story, we looked up, and even after all the different renovations of the home, the locks were still on that attic door. Mind you, at this time, it had been at least 20 years since I had babysat there. Makes me wonder what they realized they needed to keep in all these years. I did finally open the door. The hair was straight up on my neck. There were about five steps and plywood covering the rest. I opened the boards and it was just a room with some plywood on the floor, not really built out at all, but the energy was thick. I don't exactly know what happened in that home other than the one incident but it has stayed with me throughout the years. I felt for many years that there was something looking out at me every time I passed that home. The front faced a busy street and was near to the home that I was raised in and still visited. I still drive by every time I'm in town and I still feel like there's something there. About three months ago, I went backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest, and I heard drumming. At this point, I'm chalking that experience up to actual people banging on drums, but it was still strange. This weekend, we returned to the same trail system, Minister Creek. We set up camp at a different site, about three miles north of where we had stayed the last time. The evening was uneventful, and we went to bed in individual tents at about 9.30. About 2.30 in the morning, we were woken up by a huge boom. It was not a gunshot. It sounded more like a black powder cannon going off. It echoed throughout the valley. We came out of our tents and discussed what we had all heard, a little on edge since it was so close to us, but eventually tried going back to sleep. Now the boom really has nothing to do with what happened later, but it was just a weird night from the beginning. As I'm laying in my tent, unable to sleep, staring at the ceiling, I kept seeing shadows on the tent walls. I could swear that I saw a silhouette of a person walking toward the tent, but as soon as I would look, it would disappear as quickly as I noticed it. I decide I'm just seeing things, and I closed my eyes. And eventually, I fell asleep. The next thing I know, I'm being woken up by a young-sounding female voice saying, Dad, Dad, Dad. I jolt awake, unsure that I've actually heard this. So I'm just laying there, 
checking my watch, which says 5.13 a.m. I'm wide awake at this time, and about 30 seconds later, right next to my tent, I hear very urgently, Dad? Dad? There was something off about the voice, too. It was just creepy. I got major chills, like nothing I've ever experienced. Now, A, my daughter didn't come with us, and B, there wasn't a single female in our small group. It's pitch black out. I see no flashlights. No more light from the fire. I'm trying to rationalize what I'm hearing, and I sit up in my tent, thinking maybe a camper from another site wandered into our site thinking she was at her dad's tent. Maybe I should help. I unzip my tent, shine my flashlight out, and I catch a glimpse of a black bear walking off into the woods. I uncontrollably at this point let out a huge oh F, waking up the rest of my group. The bear didn't care though and just walked off into the darkness. So of course we're searching around with our flashlights and there's nobody else around us. Clearly we don't think the bear said it, but this whole experience was just nuts. I mean, what did I hear? Maybe black bears do make noises that sound like a girl calling for her dad. Or maybe it was a ghost warning me that there was a bear. A guardian angel? Or maybe I had some kind of auditory hallucination. Either way, both of my experiences overnight backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest have been pretty weird. I'm going to preface this story by saying that paranormal experiences are not abnormal to me. I have seen ghosts many times over my life, and my mom claims to have seen me playing with them as a child. My mom was a psychic medium, so I spent a good deal of my childhood around this stuff. But those are experiences for another time. This is just a little context to assure you that I have had experiences with the paranormal before and that what I experienced this time, I consider to be abnormal, generally, as most of my experiences up until now have been positive or at least neutral. This was a few years ago, in my very early 20s. I hadn't had any paranormal experiences since a little while after my mom died when I was a teenager. I was starting to think that the things I had experienced didn't happen at all. General denial. One night, on a whim while driving around a suburb near my house, I managed to convince my boyfriend to come with me to the local cemetery. I was going through a bit of an edgy phase and thought going to a cemetery at night would be cool. This is a cemetery in a big city, and it's extremely large. I didn't believe in ghosts hanging around in a cemetery, so I thought it would be fine. I believed that ghosts usually hung out around the places that they died, or places where they had unfinished business, and that it was very unlikely that they would be hanging around a graveyard. It was some time in October, but not Halloween. We got to the cemetery at about 11.30 p.m. and messed around in the car for a bit before getting out sometime around 12 a.m. We had our phones with us and were using them as torches. We hopped the fence to the cemetery and started to look at all the graves, pointing out the most interesting ones and just kind of messing around. The place was completely deserted, as cemeteries tend to be at midnight. We walked farther and farther in and entered a part of the cemetery where the graves were quite a bit larger and much older. By now, it had likely been around a half an hour. As we were walking down the path, my boyfriend commented that there was a strange smell lingering around, which was extremely weird because my boyfriend can't smell at all. He lost his sense of smell due to a bunch of infections and other problems with his ears and sinuses as a child. I don't know all the details, but regardless, he can never smell anything. I couldn't smell anything, and I have an above-normal sense of smell, so we both shrugged off the experience. I was looking at one of the graves some time later, when my boyfriend shook my shoulder and pointed at one of the largest graves a few meters into the distance. 
I'm terrible at knowing what people are pointing at, but this time, I spotted it right away. It was a little girl, I would guess around 11 or 12 years old. She had very dark brown or black hair that looked well cared for and quite long. She was sitting on top of the grave with her legs dangling over the edge. At first I saw her wearing a lacy white dress, like a nightgown that a rich girl would wear. It looked old, but I'm no expert, so I couldn't tell you how old. Maybe early 1900s? But I looked away to look at my boyfriend, and when I looked back, she was wearing a different dress. All I remember is that it was red, because at this point I was super scared. Something about the whole situation just felt wrong to me. I felt extremely fearful. And due to the fact that ghosts were very normal for me, this was extremely unusual. I had never felt unsafe seeing a ghost before. It was around this time that I noticed that the cemetery was eerily quiet. No sounds of bats, and there are lots of fruit bats in the area. No other animals. The air itself felt stale and stagnant. We just stood and stared at the little girl for what felt like an eternity, strangely transfixed. And then, we both ran for it up the path at full speed. I turned for a second to see if she was still there, but she was gone completely. And that made me run faster, honestly. The whole run out, we were both dead silent. When we were back at the car, we sat there for ages trying to work out what we had just experienced and seen, trying to rationalize it. But as we've both had paranormal experiences before, we knew it had to be a ghost. For a few months afterward, I continuously felt like I was being watched. I had frequent nightmares about seeing the little girl in our apartment. I always felt uneasy. We eventually moved around 30 minutes away, and the feelings and dreams stopped. I have since tried to research the ghost, but haven't turned anything up. Though there is a local ghost tour at that cemetery. Maybe the guide might know something. Ever since then, my paranormal experiences have been more frequent, and have been getting more unsettling and disturbing. My boyfriend has been experiencing more things too. I'm not really sure what happened there, but nothing's quite been the same since. When I was about 13, I was staying with a friend in the Colorado Rockies, the foothills, in January. While we were at his buddy's house, I walked to get food from a nearby gas station. On a small, windy country road, a car took a turn too fast, skidded on the ice, and rolled over in my direction. I was lucky that there were woods right to the side, and the dense trees saved me from the vehicle. As I ran away, I looked back, and I could only see his arm dangling limply out of the broken driver's side window. I was scared, and I still get shivers about it today. I think the person ended up dying just minutes later from the injuries. But for three days after that, I had strange dreams. They were very short, just small details. The feeling of grass, the moon, and a name. I only remember the last name now, Alton. On the fourth night, I had gone to bed early in an effort to get some sleep. I ended up drifting off at about 10 p.m., according to my friend's family. I heard a noise and woke up, but when I opened my eyes, I was laying right in front of a grave with the name Alton on it. It was a small village cemetery surrounded by pine trees. I would say it was less than 900 square feet. Despite it being mid-January in the mountains, there was no snow past the gate and in the cemetery. I was very cold, though, and scared. I managed to locate a fire watchtower where they drove me back to my friend's house. This was no dream. I woke up in a cemetery and got taken back home. According to them, they went to check on how I was doing at about 1 a.m. and I wasn't in bed. 
their home security said that I had left their back porch at 12.40 in the morning. When the park rangers picked me up, it was almost 3 a.m. I explained my story to my friends and family, and they told me that there was no cemetery behind their house. I told them what the area looked like, and they said that they had a clearing like that, but it didn't have any graves. They offered to take a look if I would lead them, but I was too shaken. I also remember there being a small gate in this fence. But before I went back home, that gate was gone, and it was just a solid fence. I don't know what happened, but I'd really love some answers, because it's been bugging me recently, so I decided to share my story. When I was about 12 years old, my family and I moved into a semi-detached house just up the street from our previous home. The house wasn't very big, and the floor plans for our part of the house were completely different from our neighbors. Our neighbors were a lovely little family of four. The husband is from England, the wife from Norway, which is where I live. They also had a little three-year-old girl and a six-month-old baby boy. Now, I love children. I always have. And at that time, I really wanted to start babysitting. It's quite common to start babysitting at age 12 here. And I was turning 13 a month later anyway, so I wanted to find some small jobs. As we got to know our neighbors over the first few months of living there, my parents told the neighbors that if they ever needed a sitter, it would be nice if they would consider trying me out. Seeing as it would be my first job as a babysitter, we thought it would be smart to start with the next door neighbors, seeing as my parents would literally be on the other side of the wall if anything happened. Cut to a Friday night when my neighbors went to a party that was happening just down our street. I got there at about 8 p.m. and the parents told me that they would be home between 2 and 3 a.m. Both kids were already asleep, so they told me to just put on a movie and relax. Now, these kids were the easiest kids to babysit ever. Once you put them to bed and they fell asleep, absolutely nothing would wake them up. They are some of the heaviest sleepers I've ever seen, so babysitting them was usually pretty uneventful. I was on the couch watching Avatar in the living room on the second floor. The kids had their own separate bedroom that was just downstairs where the front door was. I could basically see their bedrooms from where I was sitting as the place was quite small. Because of the hallway, I couldn't see the front door. The house was pretty small, so as long as the TV wasn't on too loudly, I could hear everything that was happening downstairs. At about midnight, I heard the front door unlock and my neighbors walked in whilst talking. I heard them close the door and they started taking off their jackets and shoes. I thought it was a little weird that they hadn't called to let me know that they were coming home early, but I assumed it must have just slipped their minds, so I went downstairs to greet them. I could hear them talking up until the point that I came around the corner in the hallway that led to the door. There was nobody there. The talking fell silent the second I turned the corner. The only sound was from the TV upstairs. My heart started beating so fast and my head was rushing. I ran to the bedrooms and checked the kids before I searched the rest of the house. I opened every door and checked every cabinet for anything that could have explained what just happened, but there was nothing. The kids were sound asleep. Eventually, I convinced myself that I was imagining things. I checked on the kids one last time just to make sure and their doors were wide open so that I could see them from upstairs. I sat down to finish the movie while trying to process what had just happened, but when I sat down, I noticed that the TV had been shut off, even though I had left it on. When I turned it back on, there was just snow on the screen, and for the life of me, I couldn't get it to work again. That's when the talking downstairs started up again. Not only that, but this time, the baby started screaming bloody murder. 
this baby never woke up from naps and definitely wouldn't ever scream the way that it did that night. I have never in my life run down a staircase as fast as I did that night. I rushed toward the baby's bedroom, only to find the door closed. I ripped open the door and picked up the baby and rushed to pick up his sister. I took them both upstairs and held those kids for almost three hours before the parents came back home. The talking and sounds from downstairs came and went as I had the kids with me on the couch. I held them as close to me as I could and tried my best to keep them asleep. As the parents came home, I was too scared to walk downstairs to greet them. I couldn't be sure if it was actually them or not until they walked up the stairs and found me clutching their children. Obviously, they noticed I was upset and asked me what had happened. I honestly felt like I had lost my mind at that point, but I told them the story anyway. After I was finished, they told me that it wasn't the first time something like that had happened. Apparently, they hear the voices all the time at night. I was kind of surprised that they didn't even think to warn me ahead of time. They said they were sorry that this had happened to me, and the mom walked me home to my house. I slept with the lights on in my room for almost a month after that. Believe it or not, I did go back and I did babysit those kids again. And every once in a while, I would hear the sounds from downstairs. Even though this happened a long time ago, my memory of this event is very crisp. I remember it extremely vividly, just because of how odd and traumatic it was. A couple of years ago, my family, which consisted of my dad, my mom, my little brother, my uncle and aunt, and their two children, as well as my other uncle and his wife, were at church on a Sunday afternoon. It was just a regular Sunday mass, not anything special. What I remember happening was that all of a sudden we left in the middle of the service. We were walking out and going to the parking lot, and I remember that my aunt was hysterical. She was crying and hugging my dad. My dad was almost in tears as well. I was around seven at the time, so I was really just puzzled and confused. But eventually I forgot about it and went on with my day. Years pass and the topic comes up at a family gathering. What really happened that day still creeps me out, and how my family just talks about it now, as if it wasn't such a weird thing to have experienced, is totally beyond me. Anyway, on that Sunday, my family was leaning on one of the walls of the building, facing the priest who was giving a lecture. It was really busy that day, and there weren't any seats left. About 30 minutes into Mass, my aunt notices a guy who looks almost identical to my deceased uncle in the crowd. She is stunned and elbows my dad to show him what she's looking at. The man she was pointing at was fortunate enough to have gotten a seat, and he was in one of the rows on a bench, just sitting there. As my dad is staring at this guy, he's puzzled and in complete shock. The guy looks up at my dad, makes eye contact, and smiles, and then he just looks back at the priest who's giving the lecture. My dad freaks out, and so does my aunt, who noticed that the guy was an exact copy of my deceased uncle. The guy all of a sudden gets up, excuses himself from the people that he has to cross in front of in order to get out, and walks out and exit. As soon as he does, my other uncle walks on after him in an attempt to catch up and apologize for creeping him out. My uncle claims he followed him up to the exit where he turned a corner and completely lost him out of sight. Now that's already weird, but my uncle also claims that he noticed a scar on the man's left forearm that he knew for a fact my deceased uncle had. It happened in a firework accident when he was little. Ever since then, they never saw the guy again. Some family members of ours have claimed that they've seen somebody who looks exactly like my dead uncle but who knows if it's the same guy they saw that day. Maybe it was just some random dude, or 
Maybe it was my uncle's last attempt at saying goodbye to his siblings. Who really knows? Either way, it's a story I'll never forget. Every summer, my family takes a trip to Minnesota to camp out and fish for a week. This includes my aunts, uncles, and cousins. The experience I'm about to share with you took place on Blanche Lake on a dirt road. It's an unlit dirt road surrounded by wetland and forest on each side. One night, my cousins and I stayed up extra late at the campfire and decided to walk down to the road to the highway which we often do, but never this late. It was about two o'clock in the morning, and four of the six of us decided to take the walk down the road, while myself and my cousin Nick decided to stay back and chill by the fire. After about 10 minutes, we both got this creepy feeling, like something was watching us at the fire. We decided to take the walk ourselves and meet up with our other cousins at the end of the road or on their way back. It was a clear night, and we could see every star in the sky, but it was very dark since the moon was but a sliver. We only made it about a thousand feet down the road, when something white became visible in the middle of the road up ahead. We began to jog toward it while hollering, Hey guys, wait up, thinking it was our other cousins. We got within about ten feet, when we both came to a screeching halt. It was so dark we still couldn't fully make out what we were looking at, but it appeared to be a woman with long white hair wearing a white nightgown. She was just standing there, not moving or saying anything. My cousin and I both said, Hello? Are you okay? But got no response. Neither of us wanted to get any closer, and we slowly backed away down the road from where we'd come until the woman was no longer visible. We got back to the campfire and waited for our four cousins to return. Once they got back, we asked them if they had seen anything strange or seen anybody on the road on the way back down. They said that they hadn't. We told them what we had encountered, and the remaining time that we spent by the fire that night just felt like something was still watching us. This is a real experience that happened to me when I was around 10, camping with my family at a provincial park in Newfoundland, Canada in the mid-1980s. In Newfoundland, there's a lot of traditional folklore about fairies and being fairy-led. It's sort of like being mesmerized and stolen away by the fairies, and although I've never really believed in that stuff, whenever I hear those tales, I can't help but think about this experience. We arrived at the campground in mid-afternoon. I remember that it was strangely empty. We saw no other occupied sites as we drove around, looking for the perfect spot. We picked our site, and as my parents were setting up, my older sister asked if she and I could go check out the little beach area, which was a shortish walk along a clearly marked downhill path through some birch woods. Our mum said yes, but told us to be back in two hours. We found the sign pointing us to the beach trail and headed down the path. Almost as soon as we were out of sight of the campground, things started to feel off. It was weirdly quiet, with a sort of muffled feeling. No birds calling, no breeze, just a thick, velvety silence. I also noticed that there were strange-looking ferns growing thickly along the path all around us. Ferns are not an unusual sight in the Newfoundland woods, but these were different from the ones I'd seen before. Bright, almost luminous green, and very, very large. Some were as tall as I was. I couldn't shake the feeling that there were people, or animals hiding in them, watching us pass by. Although it had been a lovely, clear day, the weather started to change as we walked. A low-lying fog rolled in as we descended, first in tendrils close to the ground, 
then gradually rising around us as we went lower toward the water. Even living in Newfoundland, I had never walked into a fog like that before, and it did nothing to relieve the eerie feeling that I was trying to ignore. Finally, we arrived at a steep set of wooden stairs, and following them, we emerged onto a small, foggy beach. With the woods behind and above us, it felt very closed in, and I started wishing that we were safely back with our parents at our campsite. My sister made a small noise beside me, and I turned to see what had caught her attention. Although I thought we were alone, I now noticed that there was a man several meters away, standing very still and gazing silently out over the water. My sister called out a friendly hello. It was Newfoundland in the 80s. People did that sort of thing. But he didn't move or appear to hear her. After a minute or two, I started to feel nervous, so I talked my sister into heading back to our campsite. This is where things get a bit fuzzy. I don't remember leaving the beach, but the next thing I knew, we were on a wide, unfamiliar dirt road. It seemed like no time had passed, but I was tired, and my legs and feet felt like I'd been walking for a long time. The sun was also pretty low in the sky, which was strange because I thought we'd been gone for less than an hour. I felt disoriented, and I had no idea where we were, and I started to panic a bit, thinking that we were lost. My sister immediately went into protective older sibling mode, saying not to worry because she was pretty sure that she knew the way back. We headed off down the road in the direction she suggested and walked for about 45 minutes or so until we finally emerged at the campground, not far from our campsite. It was now almost completely dark and we ran to our trailer to find our dad there, worriedly asking where we had been. Although we thought we'd been gone for under two hours, my dad said we'd been gone for more than five. He said that our mom had headed to the beach to look for us while he had stayed to wait for us at the campsite. By now, full-on darkness was setting in, and our dad was worried that our mom hadn't returned with us. As he prepared to go out looking for her, she burst through the door, frantically saying that she'd run up and down the trail multiple times and still hadn't found us. She was amazed when she saw us. The only way to access that beach, aside from cutting through steep, thick woods, was to take that trail, and we had not passed her. Once we'd all calmed down, we ate dinner and headed to bed. As I lay in my bunk, I remember hearing my mom quietly tell my dad how creepy and strange the trail had felt. Although we'd planned to stay longer, we packed up, and left quickly the following morning, and we never returned to that campground. This year, my partner needed to be admitted to hospital for an infection with complications. The condition was called Ludwig's angina, and I was allowed to stay with him. We were there a total of three nights. Our hospital is quite old. Think that nasty greenish linoleum and the ceiling panels with the dots. I'm not sure the exact year that it was established, but I imagine it would be over a hundred years old at this point. On the first night that we stayed, I was trying to fall asleep on a couple of chairs that I had pushed together which was not very comfortable. I tossed and turned for a bit, and then decided that I needed to get up and use the bathroom. Just before I actually got up, my head was rested on the wall beside me. Through the wall, I heard somebody softly calling out my name. Let me tell you, it scared the pee right back up there. I didn't fall asleep that night. I rather just passed out from exhaustion at a certain point. The next morning, my partner and I went for a walk to go and have a smoke, and the hospital is smoke-free, so we had to walk a bit. Just around the corner from our room, in the ward, there were two elevators. As we approached the loft, the doors popped open. We both kind of looked at each other with confusion. The light on the button had not been on, so I know that nobody called it. The doors remained open for a while, before we hesitantly stepped in. 
I felt a presence with us, next to the buttons, as I pressed the G button. When I reached over to press it, there was a cooling sensation. I suppose it just could have been a draft, but either way, we went and had our smoke and came back to find the same elevator still open and waiting for us. We both half-joked about the kind ghost orderly who was helping us get around. Unrelated to the above stay, our hospital has always had weird stuff happening, with all the lifts. For example, it will stop on floors that aren't requested, or it will go too fast or too slow. I suppose it could be easily explained away as mechanical stuff, but nobody's ever been able to find a problem, so I'm not so sure. Some of my good friends and I were going to hike in five miles on a Friday, fish an inaccessible section of the river for a state record, and hike out on Sunday. I say it's inaccessible because the whole river gets pushed into a canyon for three miles, and the only way you can fish it is to stay in the water, occasionally swimming between holes. Well, something happened and they couldn't come down until Saturday morning. I hiked in, made sure the trail was marked well for them, set up camp in the afternoon, and took off for the river to catch supper. I fished a few holes below camp to catch supper, and ended up catching four over 20 inches long. I cooked them up in a frying pan, one that I kept hidden back there, and the sky started clouding up, long black rolling clouds with a touch of green. I double-checked my tarps, dug a shallow ditch around camp, made sure my tarp was hung well over the fire, and then it came all of a sudden. It was blowing sideways. But I didn't worry. I know how to build strong shelters. I broke out the bottle of bourbon that I rolled into the center of my bedroll, leaned back in my hammock, and watched it just pour down. The lightning was constant, and it started to crack all around me. I had a good view, as twilight was starting, of the tracks across the river. With a boom, I watched lightning strike the tracks and run right up the rails for 50 yards. I took a few long drinks out of the bottle and dozed off as the storm calmed down to a drizzle in the dark. I awoke to the steady dripping of rain falling off the timber of a storm long since passed in the pitch black. The fire had died down to just a glow of hot coals, and I didn't set my lantern out in the rain. I dug in the pocket of my hammock for my flashlight. I had the sense to pull my pistol and my flashlight before I dozed off in my hammock. As I was rolling out of my hammock, I heard a sound in front of me, within 15 yards, and then a squeal to my right, and a growling kind of purr. I soon heard it all around me. The hair started to stand up on my neck, as I couldn't place what kind of creatures made all those sounds, or what could be that numerous. I sat real still, waiting on a moment, for whatever it was to stop, where I could spot it with my flashlight and my gun. I turned on my light, and I saw eyes through the sights of my gun. Eyes about half a foot, sitting on the moss squalling, and I smiled. In my buzzed, sleepy state, I had left the remainder of my fish sitting on the skillet on the rocks beside the fire and a whole family of raccoons had sniffed them out. I took a few minutes to stoke the fire with some dry pine, took the skillet full of fish and threw them just out of sight of the light of camp. With one loud clack, the mama called all the little ones to eat. The fire kept them too scared to come any closer, but they must have been hungry. I dozed back off in the hammock. The next morning I woke up and walked to where I had thrown the fish. They had cleaned up every fin, every bone, and every drop of grease, and had apparently moved on with full bellies. It definitely didn't end up being scary, but boy, it sure startled me before I knew what it was.
A few friends of mine were into exploring abandoned places and checking locations out. Whether it's a rundown shack in the middle of nowhere or an abandoned building, we were always eager to take a look around. To be clear, we don't vandalize or destroy property, we just go take a look. One day, I find out that one of the cemeteries in my area is apparently haunted. It borders on an old abandoned mental hospital, and the cemetery was the burial ground for some of the unfortunates who died at that place. The asylum is 150 years old, and it was a horrible place for those who were housed there. All up, there were four of us. After 20 minutes of driving, we get out and search for this cemetery. After about 10 to 15 minutes of looking on maps and walking up and down the neighborhood, we finally came across the cemetery's entrance. It was around 11 p.m. when we got to the cemetery. It was very quiet, barely any cars on the street, and all I could hear was the distant dogs yapping about. All four of us start heading into the cemetery. We're taking this slow and using our eyes and ears to catch anything suspicious. As we're walking, I hear a faint laugh coming from the trees below. It sounded like a child. I first wrote it off as a dog barking in the distance or just something explainable. As we continue down the track farther, I hear the child laughter again. I turn to my friend, who turns to me, and we both just stare at each other. We both heard the same thing coming from the woods below and were just spooked. But that didn't stop us. We pushed on, going farther into the cemetery and toward the trees. We eventually ended up getting too scared and decided to turn around and walk back. I was positioned with another friend of mine, about two meters behind my other buddies. All of a sudden, I can hear heavy footsteps walking toward us to our right. I'm not kidding when I say this. These footsteps just started picking up pace and we could hear these loud, thumping steps just galloping at us. We panicked like crazy because we were looking directly toward this sound and nobody was there. It was too loud to be some kind of critter and it definitely wasn't another person. I'm older now and I no longer explore urban places or abandoned places. It's too risky and I don't want to get fined, but I still can't find a logical explanation for whatever it was that we experienced that night. This happened back in 2019, around November 2nd if I remember correctly. This story is 100% true, although I'm still unsure if it was just a coincidence or what. But anyway, this is what happened. Back in 2019, I was pretty much depressed the whole year. I wasn't planning on doing anything, I just didn't care as much about my well-being. I stopped wearing a seatbelt. I didn't care if I lived or died. It wasn't that I wanted to do either, I just was apathetic. Due to this depression and things getting worse for me mentally at the time, I did a lot of really dumb things in the supernatural realm. I've always known not to speak to the dead, knowing that when you speak to one spirit, the rest can hear you as well. I've always been extremely superstitious, and I believe in the paranormal and supernatural a thousand percent. Anyway, I live next to a huge cemetery and I drive by it every day since it's right across from my neighborhood. Due to my superstitions and believing that the dead can do things us humans aren't quite capable of, each day I would scream out of the window when passing the cemetery, begging one of the spirits to, shall we say, bring me to their side. This habit started on November 2nd, I believe. So I did that each day while driving past the cemetery. Lo and behold, on November 6, I was driving to work at about 4.30 in the morning. I go the same way every single day. I was coming up on a red light. Out of nowhere, and I kid you not, 
This was literally out of nowhere. I hear this loud honk from behind me, and I was rear-ended by one of those big white RG&E trucks. You know the ones that fix telephone poles and stuff? Since I was at the red light, it basically pushed my car forward into the middle of the intersection. And once again out of nowhere, I was T-boned by some random man in a van with his wife. I was driving an 05 Nissan Sentra at the time, and it was completely wrecked. Literally demolished. But I had not one scratch on me at all. My knees were extremely bruised. I have no idea how that happened, but that was pretty much it. This also happened literally on the main road coming out of my neighborhood, about a mile down from the cemetery. And there are never cars this early in the morning. Maybe one, but even that's rare for the most part. While I was talking to the old man, they live in a town 40 minutes away, and they were driving to the park at 4.30 in the morning? The whole story is so weird, and it honestly kind of creeps me out, especially because one of the things I kept yelling was to get me in a car accident. It was an extremely bad financial situation for me at the time, and I was stuck without a car for quite some time. I think perhaps the cemetery or the spirits within it were maybe giving me what I asked for, but not what I asked for. Maybe they just wanted to wake me up and help me appreciate life again. Or maybe it was just a completely weird coincidence. Take it for what you will, but it was an extremely weird thing. I will never forget these two paranormal experiences that I had at church when I was 14. When I was 14, I went to a church gathering on Halloween night that was called Hallelujah Night. It was a Christian alternative to Halloween. My family and I would get there in the afternoon since we would volunteer to help set up the booths, cakewalk, candy barrels, etc. But I was mostly there to get first dibs on all the candy. After I finished helping with the usual booth setup, I took a seat on the bench near the main sanctuary. It was my favorite place to sit, since I could see the entire lot and, most of all, the beautiful sunset. I pulled out my PSP and was just scrolling through some music that I had on it when some guy approached me and started a conversation. I've never been a people person, so usually when things like this happen, I keep the conversation short. However, this guy had this weird kind of warmth to him, as if he was a friend of mine. As the conversation carried on, I started to ask him if he was new, because I hadn't seen him before. He told me that he'd been going to this church for years, but left after an incident happened. When I asked him about the incident, he paused, looked at me, and said that there were some things people pick up on that they know aren't normal and that you should never get curious about things that you know you should leave alone. I sort of had a confused look on my face since I didn't know what he meant at the time. The guy noticed it and said that I would understand once I got older. I looked down at the PSP that I still had in my hands, and when I looked up right away, the guy was gone. I looked around and I couldn't find him anywhere in the lot. There were just a few people still prepping for Hallelujah Night. It didn't make any sense. Fast forward to a few months later. I was sitting in the main sanctuary before leaving to do my usual volunteer work on the upper floor of the main sanctuary. The upper floor was a daycare area for kids, so at the end of service, volunteers would escort the children downstairs and I would go into each room shutting off the lights and making sure that no children were still up there. I'll never forget getting up to leave to do my usual duties when the pastor started talking about an upcoming funeral, I looked at the big screens on each side of the main sanctuary, and the face of the one man that I had been talking to during Hallelujah Night setup was there. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. To this day, it still seems unreal. I was beyond shaken as I made my way out of the main sanctuary and to the flights of big stairs 
as I went up to the upper floor. Once I made it up to the upper floor, another volunteer had confirmed that all the children were escorted downstairs. She noticed that I had a sort of pale look from seeing what I had seen in the main sanctuary and asked me if I was okay. I told her that it was nothing and I proceeded to cut off all the lights on the upper floor as she left downstairs. The upper floor was like a giant hallway with doors on each side and a door at the end of the hallway with a giant window in it. When I came to the last room at the end of the hall, I would always leave the blinds on that big window open since the light always illuminated the dark hallway and made me feel less scared. But as I left the room, I remember feeling panicked. It started freezing, and I felt like if I left that room, something would be waiting for me in the darkened rooms that was going to jump out and attack me. As I'm trying to muster up the courage to just run for it, I see a small head of a child peek out a couple of doors down. It stayed there for a few seconds, then put its head back in the room. I immediately called out to the child, but got no answer. The fear that I had had a minute ago was gone as I left the last room to go through the illuminated hallway. I made it to the other room in a matter of seconds, turning on the lights and searching the entire room for the child I saw, but no one was there. I started getting spooked again as I turned all the lights off in that room. As I was leaving the room, I looked back at the last room's window, which illuminated the hallway, and out of nowhere, a massive black mass moved in front of the window, almost covering the light completely. It was darker than dark, and its outline covered the light and seemed to be moving. It was enough to scare me to run for my life. I ran the rest of the hallway and down the stairs. I was stopped by one of the ushers who told me not to run, but when I told him what I had seen, he looked at me like I was crazy. Once church was over, I told my parents about what happened on the ride home. They ended up not believing me, but I know what I saw that day, and the man who was apparently dead had warned me of something for a reason. Either way, those two events still scare me to this very day. So the other night, my boyfriend, daughter, who's three and a half, and I were walking in the cemetery a few blocks from our house. We drove because we wanted maximum walking time with the toddler. We planned to play Pokemon Go. We entered through the main entrance, and after a few steps, I started feeling nauseous and worried. Anxious. I didn't know why, so I just ignored it. We wanted to check out the huge headstones toward the middle, so we headed that way. We noticed a car parked with its lights off, no front license plate, passenger and back doors wide open, and the man is halfway in the back seat. He's parked on one side of the big headstones, which ended up being priests. We walked through and the guy noticed us. He closed the doors that were open then went around to the driver's side and got in the car. He sat there and just watched us. So we veered away from him and went down a different path. My daughter all of a sudden says, they're so loud. I said, who? My daughter goes, the rocks, they're talking to me. My mouth drops open. We didn't tell her anything about the cemetery or headstones or what the place even is. She has no idea what they are other than big rocks. We ended up leaving and as soon as we drove away, my nausea eased up. I told my boyfriend about feeling sick and he freaked out and explained EMF to me. Creepy. We went to the store and passed the cemetery on the way home again the man's car was still there. He left after we pulled down the street that we lived on. We've had one other paranormal experience with her before. This was the second time that the afterlife, ghosts, spirits, 
something showed up to say that it exists, and it's confirmed for me. Later that night, she started talking about the rocks again and said that they were watching us. I asked her what they looked like, and she said, shadows. She said they looked like this, and then proceeded to make a worried expression. She told me that they couldn't walk with us and that they had to stay by the rocks. I don't know if the spirits were warning us about that man, or maybe there's just something not so good at that cemetery. But either way, it was a really interesting experience. Our next story was posted to r slash paranormal by Accomplished Row 520. She tells the tale of what happened when she met a strange mourner at her great aunt's funeral. Here's the story. Years ago, when my great aunt passed, at her funeral there was this old man. He was wearing a suit, and he had a neck tattoo of an octopus. He had long hair and a ponytail. He kind of looked a little bit like Jack Welker from Breaking Bad. He started talking to me about my grandma and told me to take care of her and grandpa for a few minutes. Then gave me a dollar and asked me nicely to go to the vending machine and get him a water because he came to pay his respects and he had to keep going. He even knew my name, but I had never met him before and I hadn't given it to him. When I came back to give him the water bottle, I couldn't find him. I looked everywhere and I even asked my grandparents if they had seen an older man around anywhere and I described what he looked like. When we got home, my grandparents came over and they were looking at family photo albums and they saw the man that I described, the one that asked for a water, in the pictures. They yelled at me to come downstairs and showed me the picture and pointed to him. They asked if it was the man I had seen, and I said it was. He looked exactly the same. They told me that it was my great aunt's ex-husband, Robert, who had been dead for 20 years. That's how he knew my name. He had died well before I was born, and like I said, I wasn't that close with my great aunt, so I hadn't ever really heard about him. Either way, Robert had been dead for over 20 years. I didn't sleep for at least a week, maybe more. God, the faces they made still send shivers down my spine. It was like they were watching somebody get killed in front of them when they heard about what happened to me and realized who it had been. They told me he was a good person and he and my great aunt regularly attended church and were just overall good people. I would say that I'm kind of religious, but I don't know. So more than likely, he wasn't up to anything evil, I guess. I suppose he asked for the water so I would go away and he could disappear. He really loved his wife. I guess when he said he had to move on, it's because he had to take her to the next life or something. They asked me if I spent the dollar, and I said I did. I kind of wonder what would have happened if I had kept it or what happened to whoever wound up with it. Either way, it was a very unsettling and strange experience, if not kind of sweet. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to help restore a church that was over a hundred years old. It had been vacant for roughly 45 years. The church is attached to what once was a primary school, which had already been restored into office spaces. This was a no-brainer, since it was literally a couple of blocks away from my house, under the table, and the responsibilities were incredibly easy. Since the church had been empty for years, we only worked during the day, since the electrical system had yet to be installed. But during the days I would work, I would always see movement out of my peripheral vision, but nothing was there when I would look in that direction. 
This happened a lot, to the point where I had become accustomed to it. This all changed a few months later, when the building became operational, as we converted the church to an event hall designed for any event you'd pay for. Well, after business hours one evening, I get a call from a tenant saying that something was making noise in the basement of the church. Since the power hadn't been installed to the basement at this point, I made sure to grab my brand new charged flashlight and keys to see what was happening. As soon as I got to the basement door, I could hear what sounded like power tools running. I go in and start making my way through a pitch black labyrinth of a basement toward the noise. I find the cause of the noise, which was an air compressor. I know they bleed air at times, but I made sure that I bled all the air before I left earlier that day, and I unplugged it. I looked to see if somebody had plugged it in after me, but it was still unplugged. At this moment, my brand new flashlight starts to flicker, and another unplugged power tool turns on behind me. When I turned around to shine my fading light at it, the light went out completely. I got out of that basement so fast, through complete darkness, toward the door. I get out and I see the tenant is standing at the door with a puzzled look on her face. She asks what was wrong, as I'm out of breath and clearly freaked out. I tell her what happened, and she smirks and says that that doesn't surprise her at all. She's lived in the neighborhood her entire life and tells me that as a child she attended the school and church. She then tells me a story of a woman who held the last wedding in the church before it shut down. It was a sad story because the woman was stood up on her wedding day and ultimately took her own life because of it. After that night in the basement, the paranormal activity happened more and more often. It got to the point where a coworker fell off a ladder. This ladder was always secured and he'd been up and down it a hundred times. When I asked him what happened, he said that he felt like he was pushed. There were even times when the movement that I had always seen started to take shape. Instead of a blur, I started to see a person standing there, but still nothing there when I looked in that direction. What finally pushed me over the edge was the night I guess you can say I met her. Since events were always held there, I would always lock up afterwards. After an overnight booking, I ran into the guests as they were leaving. A gentleman asks me if there were any other people in the building that night. I said no, as we make sure the office part of the building is vacant during overnight bookings. He proceeded to tell me that he heard yelling from the basement and footsteps on the balcony. I assured him that they were the only ones there and I began to lock up the building. As I'm locking the doors, I hear faintly what the gentleman was referencing. I could hear footsteps in the balcony, and I yelled out, Is anyone still here? I didn't get an answer, but at this point I was ready to go. What I hated most about locking up is the light switch is nowhere near the door, so you'd have to shut off the lights and then walk about 30 feet to the door in total darkness. I shut off the light and immediately sprinted toward the door. As I reach for the door, I hear footsteps behind me, and a muffled voice say, leave. I didn't stop to see what it was. I made my way to the glass entry doors and to the other side as fast as I could. As I'm locking the door, I see movement inside the church. I look up and I see a ghostly or shadow-like figure standing where the altar once was. I quickly looked down to ensure that I had locked the door. And by the time I looked back up, the shadowy figure was now making its way to the glass doors. I honestly don't remember if I locked the door or not, because I immediately got out of there. After that night, I made sure that I never entered that building after dark again. Needless to say, I quit shortly thereafter. While kayaking on Green River, traveling above Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, these friends would encounter a sound they had never heard before, and one they hoped to never hear again. Here's their story. 
A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky, which runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc., and camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most of the time. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there is nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful. The second day around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon about 30 feet wide and so deep that the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for ground sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired, and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while, before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out, when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, not like an owl's screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower pitched toward the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox or a boar or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap or leaf crinkle when whatever it was finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but remarkably, Nobody had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided that this would have to do, as we didn't want to go any farther down river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split in two, and, in the middle, formed a collection of pale rocks tall grass and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 or 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. Suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, 
followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling in confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all decided it had to have been a falling tree, and we went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So, we packed up and headed out onto the river one last time to go home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the strange things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened at all. No mysterious forest noises, to both my disappointment and relief. Redditor Rez on the Radio tells a story about waking up to an alarming situation. Here's the story. So, I have a simple story for you. I always go to sleep with my bedroom door unlocked and the key for the door to one side on a shelf. Every time I have ever fallen asleep around people, they've said that I'm most quiet, that I'm almost a dead-looking sleeper because I move so little. To my knowledge, I have never sleepwalked. One day, I remember going to sleep as usual, door unlocked, key on the shelf. I woke up to my mom banging on my bedroom door, confused as to why it was locked. I found the key on the shelf and unlocked the door. I tried to explain that I hadn't locked it, and I was just as confused as she was. It was very disorienting, and I think I probably looked like I was going crazy. It's something that I've wondered about a lot in my life. I don't think I'll ever get an answer as to how I woke up with my door locked from the inside when I was the only one in there. This story was posted to Reddit by user Wernever Klimt, who tells about a theater with a ghostly reputation. Here's the tale. About 30 years ago, I spent several years working in movie theaters in Worcester, Massachusetts. My favorite was the huge old building that had been chopped up into four separate cinemas. It had been a beautiful theater back when it was built in 1926 as the Poli Palace. Though it had been semi-destroyed during modernization in the late 50s, there were still many original features of the building that remained. As a manager, I had been issued a big keychain that gave me access to the entirety of the building, and I spent countless hours exploring nearly every part of that building. Except the curtain loft, which would have required climbing an iron ladder up about 80 feet. No thank you. The building had attics and basements and crawl spaces. There was an area in the front of the building on the second floor that had two or three abandoned businesses that had been walled off. There was a music store and a ballet studio and maybe an office. There was also a bathroom. Everything looked like it was from the 1940s or 50s. Faded wallpaper with ballerina motif, a peeling mirror on the wall. In another section of the building was the old manager's office, with high ceilings and crown molding and a beautiful stained glass window that I believe dated back to 1912 and had previously been part of an adjacent theater. There was still an old safe in the office. I found a newspaper article in the public library from 1942 or 44 that detailed an armed robbery 
when two men had tied up the managers in the office and robbed the safe. One of those men was later executed in the electric chair for an unrelated crime. We used the old manager's office to store giant 30-gallon bags of popcorn. There was also a sort of crawl space under the box office that was accessible by lifting a hinged plywood panel and climbing over a four-foot wall. On the other side were the remains of a couple of basement rooms with broken concrete and bricks strewn about. In one of those rooms, I found an old flared Coca-Cola glass in perfect condition. I kept it for years. I also found a deck of cards in a handmade leather pouch with a snap closure, fashioned out of a buffalo nickel. There were also old dressing rooms with makeup mirrors and light bulbs. The paint was peeling off the walls in potato chip sized flakes. As you can surmise, the building was purported to be haunted. The head manager claimed to have had ghostly experiences, so I'll start there, I guess. When the building was remodeled in the late 1950s, the men's room in the basement was converted into the manager's office. One night, while closing up, the manager, my boss, made his way up to the stairs to the main lobby. As he emerged, something caught his eye. Way up by the ornate 30-foot ceiling, he saw an apparition floating there. It disappeared into the ceiling. Terrified, he ran back down the stairs and hid in the office until daylight. Another time, he was again working late. There were several arcade machines in an area of the lobby, and they were normally powered off when the last shows were in. As he climbed the stairs, he heard all of the machines making their electronic bleeps and bloops. He was annoyed that the usher had clearly failed to turn off the machines before punching out and realized that he would have to go do it himself. As soon as he opened the door though, the noises stopped dead. Looking across the lobby from where he emerged, the machines were all dark. They were indeed powered off. A projectionist claimed that he looked out of the booth window one night in the big theater upstairs while shutting things down and saw a face looking in at him. I take those stories with a grain of salt. I was always skeptical of those based on the sources, but here's my experience. I was obsessed with the history of the building and would research newspaper archives for articles about it. There were rumors that a stagehand had died there in an accident during the time that it had been a vaudeville theater. I was never able to confirm that. I had talked about the building to my mother, and she, in turn, happened to discuss it with a woman that she worked with. The woman claimed to be a psychic or clairvoyant, or maybe just that she would get feelings about things. She told my mother that she had been to that theater and that she felt that somebody had indeed been killed there and that his name began with the letter M. My reaction was, okay, sure, she sounds nutty. Sometime later, I was the sole manager on duty on a slow night midweek. I was alone in the office in the basement. The seven o'clock shows were in, and I was doing paperwork. The intercom buzzed. It was the box office cashier calling to tell me that I had a phone call. I asked who it was, and she said that she didn't know. I hung up the intercom and pushed the button for the main incoming line where the call was holding. The earpiece erupted with loud, close squealing and static. I used the word close because it was so loud and distinct that I assumed that it was something wrong with the phone PBX in our building rather than the line itself or the caller's phone. It was just the impression I had. Hello? Nothing. Just more squealing and static. Hello? I repeated. Hello? A man's voice. Calm, flat, distinct. Then nothing further. Who is this? I was a bit perplexed. All of the noise on the line and the caller seemingly reluctant to speak. This is Mike. Calm, quiet, not shouting over the noise of the line like he couldn't even hear it. Quite audible and clear, then nothing but the awful squealing and static. 
I waited a few seconds for the caller to continue. After all, he called me. Presumably there was a reason. But nothing. Mike who? I said, feeling a little bit impatient. Mike is a common name, and there were two Mikes employed there at the time. One of them had a fairly high-pitched voice that sounded nothing like the caller. It didn't sound like the other Mike either. The line abruptly went dead. Silent. The squealing and hissing stopped. I waited. Nobody called back. I called Sandy, the box office cashier, and asked her if they had asked for me personally or just to speak to the manager. She said that the caller had asked for me by name. And suddenly, I remembered my mother's friend. A man's name beginning with the letter M. Mike. It never happened again, and the phone never made those noises again. No one ever confessed to some kind of a prank. And I never figured out who it was. Redditor's psychological aunt, 8611, posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter and there was deep snow we were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. There was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner, Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night. And it just makes me wonder. In Southeast Asian culture, there's a particular ghost or demon that has its head detached from its body. It floats around with the intestines floating around below it, and apparently it glows. If you're Cambodian, you would know it by the name of Arb or Op. I believe in Thai it's called Krasue. You can Google it and get a good picture. Anyway. During high school, I was hanging out with a group of my friends who were all Southeast Asians. We were hanging out really late into the night, probably about 1 or 2 a.m., just drinking and overall just talking about random crap in the parking lot of an apartment complex. One of the guys, real tough dude that was physically bigger than us and never afraid to throw it down against others, had to go relieve himself. He went to the side of the apartments where there were no lights. After a minute or so, we just heard this loud yell of, Oh shit! Dude literally ran back to us with his pants still unbuttoned and unzipped, with his pants covered in urine. The look on his face was one of sheer terror. We asked him what had happened, and he told us that he saw an op floating around. 
Feeling pretty uneasy about the whole thing, the other guys pulled out their guns. We waited for not even three minutes before finally just heading back home. When the older folks in the complex heard about it, they mentioned that one of the residents was practicing some kind of black magic and that maybe she had conjured it, but no one's ever really done anything about it. I mean, what can they do, right? Everybody suspected this girl, but no one really knows. The weird thing, though, is that she died later, and nobody ever knew why. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal, my alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that, and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock, and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, Nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. 
One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out, I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, 
I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she says she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. This happened two summers ago. It's short, but confounding. I was with two friends in my truck. I was driving, and it was dark, but not necessarily late, probably about 10 p.m. We were traveling to Page, Arizona, Lake Powell area, from Durango, Colorado, and we had to pass through Cayenta, Arizona, part of the Navajo reservation. Now, I had been to Cayenta before several years prior with a friend of mine who grew up there. We spent an entire day just having a great time with his people. But as soon as the sun started dropping, his mother and grandmother were insisting that we get off the reservation before dark. I knew it had a reputation for the weird, as many reservations do at night. At least that's what I'm told. Flash forward to this trip, and my two friends and I are in the truck. It's a long, straight, 
unlit two-lane road with classic red desert on both sides in the daylight anyway. Not that we could see that at night. There's another vehicle coming the opposite way, and there's no crossroad in that stretch. That's important, because right before we go past each other, something I can only describe as metallic went streaking right between us, perpendicular, like feet away from both of our bumpers. It looked to be about the size of an SUV, no lights or discernible shape, but it seemed smooth. It's a weird comparison, but that speeding bullet in Mario Kart is actually what came to mind when it happened. All three of us saw it, and I think the other people did too, because I saw them hit the brakes in the rear view. It was super weird, and I still don't really know how to explain it. In 2014, my grandmother turned 86. She lives in Vietnam, and we live in Canada, but we decided that that should be the year we finally visited. It was my first time visiting my ancestral homeland. We've never really been able to afford a family trip to Vietnam before, but my mom convinced my dad, since she hadn't seen my grandmother, her mom, since 2006 when she visited us in Canada. We bought tickets in April and scheduled for August. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away in June. It sucked. Hard. Anyway, the Vietnamese have this superstition that for 49 days after someone dies, their spirit is still hanging around our mortal plane, waiting to be judged or reincarnated or whatever. So maybe three weeks after she died, one of my aunts was just tending to her market stall, per usual. This frail old woman, most likely homeless, suddenly walks up to the stall. She starts talking to my aunt, saying something along the lines of, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I didn't want to leave you all so early. Speaking distinctly in a maternal tone, almost on the verge of tears. It was pretty shocking and unexpected, obviously. Right after she said that, the old woman's whole body shook. A couple of seconds later, this lady regained her senses, looked around kind of confused, and walked off. My aunt told us this when we visited in August, and I couldn't sleep that night, so thanks for that, auntie. They also believe that my grandmother chose to speak to my aunt through the old woman, because frail, weak people close to death themselves are believed to be easier to take control of. That's about all I know about that, but I thought I'd share. One night, my sister's friend, who we'll just call Sally, was still at our house after my sister had fallen asleep at about 10 p.m. She asked me if I would walk her halfway home, and I said yes. It was just down a hill, and then you just walked one street, and then there was like a cut to over to her street from there. But mind you, it's the middle of December, and it's really cold. So we walked to the stop sign, and we were both like, nope, and turned around, because it was freezing cold. We could easily beg my aunt to give her a ride, because it wasn't that far. So as we're walking back, we stopped at my next door neighbor's house, which isn't actually occupied. It's completely rusted out. It's actually owned by a sheriff that comes by like once a week to work on it. It's been like that for about the last three years but my old neighbor lived there for about 20 years before he finally sold it to the sheriff for like $5,000. Anyway, we stopped at the house because we kept hearing weird noises from the side of the house. It almost sounded like cats, so we started calling them. Then they started hissing in a weird way. And then we saw their legs. They were long and skinny and super pale. 
I don't know what it was, but we just ran to my house and we told my cousin's dad to go look. And he didn't, of course. Maybe it was just a weird cat, but those legs were so abnormal. I've never seen anything like it. And their sound changed when we became aware of it and started calling it. It was like as soon as whatever those things were knew that we knew they were there, their whole demeanor just changed. It was so weird. This happened in 2009, during my summer holiday when I was eight years old. As we had done for many years, my family and I went to Cordoba, Argentina, and rented a cabin. Strange things often happened at that cabin, like objects moving around, strange noises, or even items that just disappeared. One night, I was sleeping when I suddenly got up in the middle of the night. I looked in front of me, and there was an old, creepy woman who was just staring at me. She didn't say a word. So I just closed my eyes, and when I opened them, she was gone. I ran to my father's bedroom and told my parents, but of course they didn't believe me. About two years ago, we went to those cabins again. One day, I struck up a conversation with the owner, and he was telling me about some strange noises he had heard that night. Surprised, I told him about the creepy vision that I had had. He just answered, you are not the first one that that has happened to. Many people have reported having visions of an old woman or a girl who stares at them in the night. So I'm walking to my new job at FedEx, and I didn't realize that I had to walk past a cemetery. Mind you, my shift is from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. I've walked past many cemeteries in my life, so I wasn't too concerned at first. I had a pretty lit up highway on my left, and on my right was a large cemetery. No cars, no people, just me. As I kept walking, I start feeling uneasy about the vibes. It wasn't fear, nor was I scared, but it was dreadfulness and sadness overall. And to make matters worse, I didn't realize that it was 3 a.m. at the time. I tried to look straight ahead and not acknowledge the fact that I had a cemetery six feet away from me, just engulfed in complete darkness. But I couldn't. And I can't explain really what I felt, but it was just awful, like a heavy feeling of sadness, but it felt cold. After walking for 20 straight minutes and realizing I had another 15 to go, I decided to just go back home. As I started walking back, I started hearing the grass rustling, as if somebody was following me. Honestly, I think my mind was playing tricks, but the whole time, I felt like I was being watched. I've had a good amount of paranormal encounters in my life, so I'm familiar with this feeling. But I just felt so afraid at that point. I just wanted to share this experience because it kind of had me distressed, and I'm just curious to see if anybody else has had a similar experience. This happened just a couple of years ago. I went to Ireland to study for a couple of weeks. There, I met this large group of people from my same country. I didn't know anyone. One boy caught my attention among all of them. In the exact same moment I saw him, I thought, I've already seen him. He just seemed so familiar. I approached him and we started talking. I didn't mention to him that he looked familiar. 
I found out that he lives really far from my city, in a region I have never visited, and that he has never visited my region either. I also found out he arrived in Ireland after me, so there was no way for me to see him at the airport or anything like that. Then, after some time chatting, he said, Have we already met? I was thinking you look really familiar. That really freaked me out. We never figured out how it was possible to feel like we had met each other before, because we certainly never had. And to this day, it just feels like such a glitch in the matrix kind of experience. I don't really know how to explain it. On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and coworkers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear. Cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is or how that stuff got into my trunk. This story was posted to r slash paranormal by user accomplished work 454. When he and his friends were playing in a forest nearby their home as kids, they encountered something that they're unlikely to forget anytime soon. Here's the story. I'm from Ohio in the United States. When I was in the fourth grade, 10 years old, I'm 19 now, my buddies and I were out in the woods behind my buddy's house. We were always back there growing up. There was a creek that we would hop over, and just on the other side was a farm with some horses. One day, we had just jumped over the creek, but were still in the woods right by it. That's when we heard what sounded like a little girl's scream at the top of her lungs. Being young kids, we all just froze, thinking it was odd to hear such a vibrant scream in the middle of the day. About five to seconds later, right in front of us, a black figure zoomed across some bushes and shrubs at lightning speed. 
We all looked at each other and bolted out of the woods to my buddy's house. We were all in shock about what we had seen, and to this day we still talk about how creepy it was. It moved so fast that there's no way it could have been human. And where I live, the only wild animals we have are white-tailed deer, coyotes, and foxes. This thing was at least six to seven feet tall and was black enough to look like a shadow or something. It didn't look like it was absorbing any light at all, or that it was absorbing so much that it was the darkest black I've ever seen. I'm curious if anyone else in Ohio, or the United States for that matter, has ever seen anything similar. I live right by the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, so maybe there have been some sightings there. Even though this wasn't in the National Park, just a small patch of woods in a pretty suburban area. My best friend, I'll call her Gray, and I wanted to hang out, so we decided to go for a hike. I chose a reservation that I had been to multiple times before so that we could still have hope of navigating through the long trails in case we got lost. In hindsight, it was a pretty strange decision to go hiking, considering that it was mid-February in New England and it was still pretty cold out. This day in particular was especially foggy and colder than we had expected. We took the bus to the northern entrance of the reservation and headed toward the southern entrance about a four and a half hour long trail. This was Gray's first time visiting the reservation, so she was attempting to take photos along the way. I say attempting, because whenever she took her phone out, she would manage to snap a few photos before her phone would shut off and restart, probably because of the cold. My phone wouldn't even turn on at all. Nearing the end of the trail, we come across an extremely picturesque setting a large barren tree with a wooden swing attached to the largest branch on the edge of a frozen foggy pond. The first people we see since we arrived was a man swinging a little girl, probably about four years old, wearing a bright pink jacket. We get closer and Gray manages to take a handful of photos before her phone repeats the cycle of death. She tells me that she wants to swing after they leave so we wait patiently, giving them enough space to not ruin their moment. Not even 10 minutes into waiting, we notice that the man has stopped pushing the little girl and instead is just standing there, staring straight at us without any expression on his face. Gray and I turn around to avoid the creepy eye contact for a few seconds. And when we turn back around, the man is coming straight at us on an all black unicycle. Gray screams, and right before he would crash into us, he makes a sharp turn straight into the woods. I will never forget how creepy this man's face was. He had absolutely no emotion at all, and literally looked pale as a ghost, almost green in the face. We look back at the little girl to see her struggling to run after him, eventually disappearing into the woods as well. Gray and I debated on going after the little girl for a while, but decided not to since neither of our phones were turning on and we still had about a half an hour to reach the southern exit of the reservation. I start pushing Gray on the swing and as we're trying to dissect what just happened and where this man got a unicycle from, something across the pond catches my attention. I can barely see it through the fog but quickly realized from the bright pink color that the little girl was watching us from between the trees. What makes us even crazier is that the man and the little girl disappeared into the woods heading east, and the other side of the pond was west of where Gray and I were. This little girl did not have nearly enough time to have gone all the way around without either of us noticing. I pointed out to Gray, and she immediately jumps off the swing and we both start running to the exit without exchanging a word until we're in the clear. We walked about another 45 minutes until we reached civilization again and found a place to go eat. 
We go in and Gray plugs her phone into an outlet so that it can turn back on, and we look through all the photos. All the photos from the day are there, except the last four photos that she took of the man and the little girl. In their place were just plain black thumbnails with an error message that read, file not found. To this day, we can't make any sense of that situation. I went back to that reservation several times afterwards. I tried avoiding that pond at all costs. The one time I did revisit the pond area was because of a dare with a group of friends, only to discover something equally as strange. It was about 9 p.m. and completely dark, and there was a group of about 20 to 30 people having a picnic in what looked like colonial era clothing. We kind of creeped on them for a few minutes and decided to just head back before they noticed us. But the fact that they were having a picnic without any sort of lights or lanterns in the middle of the woods was pretty weird. I'm still not really sure what's going on at that pond, but I don't think I'll be going back anytime soon. Some friends and I recently visited an abandoned nursing home. We found all kinds of old cool stuff and it was really interesting walking around in there. We took a spirit box with us to see if we could get any interaction with ghosts. We were standing in a dark, empty room, put all our lights out, and turned on the spirit box. We made contact with multiple people. We asked them questions and they responded. I had never talked to ghosts before, so this was really special for me. There were a lot of voices. We kept talking to them until we heard a very loud bang from upstairs. We were startled, and our first reaction was to turn everything off and stay silent for a while. After some time, it was still quiet, so we moved on exploring the rest of the building, until later, again we heard a very loud bang from upstairs. Again we kept quiet and waited. But at this point, it began to get really scary. We went upstairs and we saw this big blood splatter against the wall. At that point, we knew that maybe it was time to go. So we were slowly heading back. We got right in front of a big closed door that we wanted to exit through when we heard a loud noise from the other side of it. We ran as fast as we could to the nearest exit. We actually had to crawl through a hole in the wall to exit the building. As we were outside, we looked up to the floor where we had heard the noise coming from, and we saw something that looked like a shadow standing in the opening of a hole in the wall. It was hard to see since it was dark outside. Still, to this day, I'm very curious about what was behind that door, but maybe it's better that we never found out. After the death of their grandfather, Redditor Omastorm had an encounter that startled and comforted them. This is the story. A few years ago, my grandpa had passed away. He wasn't a very big believer in ghosts or anything regarding the paranormal, until he was in his older years. Well, I ended up inheriting his 86 T-Bird. Lots of history with that car between myself and my grandpa. Anyway, a few months after he passed away, I'm driving the car to work, listening to music, and just processing the fact that he was truly gone. The car is all I have left, or so I thought. I drive toward one of my work sites, and out of nowhere, I get a blast of the cologne he always wore. It was his favorite cologne to use whenever he was going out anywhere. I pull up to my work site and park the car, I can smell the cologne so strongly in the passenger seat, and I'm just staring at it like, there's no cologne in here, but why does it smell like grandpa's? It took me a solid two minutes to figure out that his spirit was in the car with me. His spirit had taken a ride with me to work that day. The cologne scent didn't dissipate one bit. 
It was honestly reassuring to me that he was still there, in a way. So yeah, interesting and odd encounter for me, because of the fact that when he was alive, he wasn't really a strong believer in the afterlife. Well, I guess he proved himself wrong, because he still hangs around me whenever something's wrong. My name is Josh and I am 26 years old. I was an only child and I didn't have very many friends, so I spent a lot of time alone. When I was about 11, I moved in with my grandparents. They lived in a small town, pretty rural, and I spent most of my days, especially on the weekends, outside walking around. There was an old cemetery within walking distance of my grandparents' house that had graves dating back all the way to the late 1600s in the oldest section. The newest graves were no younger than the late 90s and early 2000s. It was pretty run down since the newest graves, like I said, were in the 90s and 2000s. The oldest section was even more run down. I felt bad that these people were seemingly just forgotten and nobody ever visited them. My grandma owned a flower shop and she had a bunch of excess flowers. So I asked her if I could take some to put on some of the graves in the cemetery. She agreed and I took about four bags full and walked to the cemetery. I got there and started walking around, putting flowers on all the graves. I went through the newest section, putting flowers on the graves without incident. I had gotten through about four graves in the oldest section when something just told me to look up. I looked up and saw a woman, just standing there, directly behind the grave that I had just put flowers on. She was smiling at me, and she seemed to be so happy. I stood face to face with her for about a minute, and then she disappeared. Then I went on putting flowers on the rest of the graves, and I left. I think maybe she was just happy that somebody was coming to visit. I don't know, but it was really special. There's this book called Fairies, Real Encounters with Little People by Janet Ford, and in it she discusses stories both old and modern of encounters with fairies and gnomes and things like that. There was this one that was written by a doctor in the late 1700s. He recounted a time when he was just a boy. He and several friends spotted gnomes dancing in a field. They were all holding handkerchiefs between them, like Moorish dancers. He said that when these gnomes spotted them, one of the gnomes chased after them and even grabbed this doctor as he slipped through a fence. The boy pulled free and said that the gnome, which he described as having a swarthy face, reached after him, but was unable to grab him a second time. They ran to their parents, who immediately went out looking for these gnomes, but they had disappeared. According to the book, gnomes and other interdimensional beings were fond of kidnapping children, who would then act as servants in their world. Another story was actually printed in the Anchorage Daily News, a snowmobiler had spotted a young boy in a snow-covered field, all alone, and with no footprints anywhere. The boy just seemed to have appeared there. The boy said that he was taken into a local hill, one that local Eskimos had said was haunted. The boy said he found himself in a city and met a girl who had been kidnapped and brought there 40 years earlier. She asked the boy for help. The boy said that the Inserat, something like that, think it was the name the Eskimos gave these beings, had let him go for whatever reason. I find these stories really interesting, and I'm just curious if anyone else has experiences like these.
My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift to see and experience things that were, I guess, paranormal for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, and me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened, someone would die or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after, and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room, when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members, but nothing, just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me, but long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me, and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. In August of 2019, my mom got sick. She had a stroke, has diabetes, and so on. So the first time that my mom got sick, my brother was the one who stayed with her. And the second time she got sick, I stayed with her. Mostly because my brother couldn't be patient enough to take care of her again. My mom was being placed in a room that could fit six patients. There was this one time that I went to the canteen, and I bought like food and stuff like that. When I was in the elevator, a guy came in, so it was just the two of us. After I bought some things from the canteen, I went back using the same elevator, and I accidentally met the same man again, with the same elevator, just the two of us in it. We talked a little bit before the elevator opened. When it did, we heard some people screaming and crying. He asked me, what happened? Why are they screaming and crying like that? I said, I don't know, maybe a patient just passed away. If yes, may they rest in peace. I barely heard him say, thank you, like whispering. I didn't really pay any attention to it. I said goodbye to him and I walked to my mom's room. After a little bit of conversation, I went back to my mom's room and the crying and screaming voice was actually from that room. So I was kind of curious about who the person was that had passed. The nurse opened the curtain to prepare to move the body, and I was absolutely frozen. The person who had died was the guy that was talking to me in the elevator, 
and two had asked me what had happened. After that day, I had nightmares for a week, and now I'm always pretty paranoid whenever I go into an elevator. I don't know if this story is interesting to anyone else, but it definitely shook me up. This is a memory that I have about my family going to the hospital in which I was about to be born. I recently started thinking about this memory again for some reason. It's just something that I cannot find a logical explanation for, considering that I'm a hyper-skeptical guy. The memory is seeing my dad and other family members walking their way out of my grandma's house, where we used to live, to see my mom give birth my birth at the hospital. I can perfectly recall how my dad was dressed that day. For the rest of my family, it's kind of a blurred image. My dad was wearing a black blazer and blue tie with pink diagonal stripes, black jeans, and a lighter blue shirt. I remember even how he was walking while smiling, a pretty detailed and vivid sequence of images. So, as expected a couple of years ago, I might have been 20 at the time, I'm 28 now, I was going to tell him about this weird memory, but before that, I decided to ask him first about how he was dressed the day of my birth, to make sure he didn't just go along with the memory to fool me. And yes, you guessed it, it was the exact same way that I remember. He said he perfectly remembers since he planned it beforehand what he was going to wear for the day of my birth. I freaked out so hard. I would ask myself how this is even possible. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started trying to figure this all out, and I came up with a theory. I later dismissed it, but my family used to record my cousins and I all the time in childhood with this old camera and then put them on VHS tapes. So I started thinking that maybe an uncle of mine or someone else had recorded that moment of my family on the way to the hospital. So I decided to go over all the tapes that I had, plus it's fun watching them. But no, I didn't find anything even remotely close to that image that I had in my mind. Plus, after re-watching my life series on these tapes, I realized they started recording after I turned one year old. So, yeah, one-year-old me tapes were the oldest tapes made, nothing before that. Another thing that I realized, the way that I remember this scene of my family couldn't be recorded in this weird angle and perspective. It was like I was looking at them, walking, but also being careful to not be seen, kind of hiding a little bit behind a wall. Kind of an odd way to record something, right? So that's my story about this weird yet accurate and vivid memory that I have before I was even born. I'm still trying to make sense out of it. Every time I start thinking about it, I can't stop until I sleep. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to buy alcohol. As we each threw in suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, which is a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 at night. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then we began to head toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning, right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat, a red coat, and this figure was extremely short. This sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. It looked a little bit like a doorway. I didn't really want to stick around. 
I played it cool as if nothing had happened and returned to my group. And, of course, I never mentioned it to anyone. But I'm pretty sure I saw a gnome at Stowe Lake. Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes, row your boat, hickory dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead, the book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the Golden City to join the Angel Band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learned from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learned the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again, just Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as it was supposed to. I was really young. I can't remember how young, but I must have been under six. I was at my grandparents, and they have an outside sauna in a building with a workshop next to it. I was with my grandpa, and we were talking about something as we entered the sauna. Then my grandpa goes to the heater to put logs in, or maybe to store them next to it. I can't really remember which. But I was facing the benches as we were talking. The next thing I know, there's a little gnome that peeked its head over and looked straight at me from a hole where all the water goes onto the floor. It must have been only a second, because I stood still and silent, and then it just went away. I told my grandpa, but I don't know if he took it seriously. I didn't know how to feel. I was fascinated, but a little creeped out by it. Later, my grandpa told me something about gnomes living underground, as it is often in Finnish folklore, which made it even more mysterious to me. I know it wasn't a dream, because it shocked me and I remember it so clearly, and I was wide awake. I didn't know where to tell this story, I just thought it would be interesting to tell. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking, and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. 
as we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore, or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail, and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking. But thankfully, he said no, because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience, and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. When I was about seven years old, my mom was at work, and my dad was watching me. I was an only child, and I didn't have any friends over at the time. I'm pretty sure my dad and I were playing with Barbies when we both heard two children laughing. Nothing malicious, just playful. Then, all of a sudden, we hear a loud thud coming from my bedroom. Naturally, my dad and I went to go check it out. All of the stuffed animals that I had on the bottom bunk were on the floor. I had a bunk bed, but the entire twin mattress wall was filled to the brim with stuffed animals. Every one was on the floor. Nothing could explain how they had fallen, other than perhaps the children we heard laughing seconds before had pushed them off. I had many experiences with the paranormal. We did live close to a funeral home and a cemetery, and this was just one of many things that happened when we lived there, but it's still one of my favorite stories. When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky, was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about nine o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. The moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves, though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source. I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon, though, I turned around to face the camera once more. 
My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling, and took two photos. Neither was in focus, though, and at that point I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to. About 15 years ago, my old high school group decided that we were going to attempt to contact my friend Ben's biological dad. He had recently died before he got to know him. Now, Ben was absolutely wild. He wasn't scared easily. My high school sweetheart was with us and he was absolutely terrified. I owned a necklace that had items placed on it for protection from spirits. To help ease his anxiety, I placed the necklace around his neck. We partook in the devil's lettuce and started our session giggling. I was no believer in Ouija boards. It didn't bother me one bit that we decided to do this in an abandoned church deep in the woods either. Only my boyfriend was terrified, which caused our friends to tease him mercilessly. The board was set up and we got serious. We had no idea, however, just how serious this was about to become. As the planchette moved to spell his father's name, I smiled, thinking that this was his closure. He was clearly doing it because he had refused to share the name beforehand. It had to be him. But looking into his eyes, I saw something I had never seen etched into his face. It was fear. I can't remember how it all went down, but suddenly the board was spinning and it had spelled out murder. I was starting to feel cold, even in the heat. That's when it all went to crap. The pews, already broken, were shaking uncontrollably, even toppling over. We were in a back room that was essentially empty, but we ripped open the door to discover the pews falling over. It started a massive panic to get out of the building. As I was running, I realized my boyfriend wasn't with us in the woods. I turned back right as Ben and a few others pulled off in their cars. Once I re-entered the dilapidated church, my boyfriend was stuck, literally stuck to the floor, screaming. The building was still shaking. It was ice cold, and it felt like a sock had been shoved in my mouth. I remember my best friend helping me carry him out of the building. Within an instant, he had his wits about him and refused to talk about what happened. He looked like he'd just been through war. He opted to keep my protection necklace on, citing that the demon may follow one of us. We never really talked about what happened. That was very strange for my very open friend group. We knew it wasn't an earthquake, because we live just about an hour below the Blue Ridge Mountains of Appalachia, and we never get quakes that could move furniture like that. And to be honest, I felt something dark around me, until a cleansing 11 years later after the scariest haunting I'd ever experienced happened. I don't know what we released, or have any clue how it could have been a natural event. Something threw those church pews to pieces, and, needless to say, we never went back. In a harrowing moment, Reddit user Cherry Cranberries encountered a police officer who saved their life. But was it an officer or an angel? You decide. I was telling this story to someone today. I haven't spoken about this story in many years, but I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely 20 years old, living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school. 
and this particular day was very snowy, icy, and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying that they're heading to work. That's just New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road which I was driving on was a two-lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads here, there are no shoulders, and there was no turnaround. Once you were on this highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was the type of highway where if your car stopped, you were pretty much screwed because there was nowhere to pull off. Again, no shoulders or grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and a barrier in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's coworker had died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly, my car fishtailed and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane, facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me. Like, coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my car was in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock. Like, how did that just happen? The tractor trailer blew past me in seconds. I mean, I would have been literal toast if I hadn't gotten to that shoulder. Breathing really heavily, I said to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver's side window. I open the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He says, hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now and his car parked right behind me in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that we had, which ended quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued and said, uh, you were going too fast. I said, yeah, I know. And then he says in this soft but direct tone, stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so I can turn my car around the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it, but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember that my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to do that without his intervention. And slowly I pulled it back in the proper direction that I was supposed to be going in. I continued on and I looked behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on or the car themselves if they turn it off or whatever. But all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me to drive. It's weird to explain, but this cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. And like I said, there was nowhere for him to go. The only turnaround that small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions wasn't for another mile ahead, and the first exit off wasn't for another five miles. The small little shoulder ended up right where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in my mirror and saying out loud, where did he go? It was so odd that I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what had happened. Of course, in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer, I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse, how I have no recollection, 
and of the magical cop that showed up in ten seconds and disappeared just as fast. My own parents thought that it was the strangest thing. I've told this story to a few people I know, and they've also thought it was weird. I think, and my parents agreed, that either that cop was sent by God at the exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade, and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back onto the highway, unless I had taken a great risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone else hitting me, while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter, and whoever it was, I won't soon forget it. When Redditor O.G. Wiz was 15 years old, they lived in a basement apartment at their parents' house. What happened there stuck with them for the rest of their lives. Here's the story. My parents bought their house in 1996. The family that owned it before us renovated the basement to be an apartment complete with its own kitchen and bathroom. So obviously, at 15, I lived in the basement apartment. I stayed there until 2013. I had this TV stand that I used for storage space. It sat next to the bathroom door. It had a couple of old computers on it, some boxes of random junk, and a ton of DVD cases. They were all empty cases. I had separate storage for the discs themselves, but I had a thing about not letting go of useless items, apparently. In the living room, which I didn't really use much, there were a couple of old couches. The family cat preferred to hang out there on one of the couches. One night, probably around 11 p.m., I went to use the washroom. The cat was on the couch, and no one else was home. I opened the door to leave the bathroom, and suddenly a DVD case shot from the TV stand and hit the wall across the room. At the same moment, the cat jumped up, arched its back, and started hissing. Then the cat ran upstairs. That was the only time that this happened to me in that basement. And it's the only time that I ever saw that cat, who recently died at the age of 22, hiss or arch his back at anything. I've only had a few experiences in my life that I would consider paranormal. I don't really much believe in this stuff, to tell you the truth, but I could not figure out any other explanation for the DVD case flying across the room, or for the cat to act so out of character. I don't know what it was, but I believe that something was there that night. For our next story, Redditor The Odd News shares a fascinating tale about a coal mine and the ghost he encountered within it. Here's the story. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, a father, and a miner myself. I'm the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than a true elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking toward the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we get into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What we called an engine can be considered to be a small train. 
It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers on the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this, but sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then, there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved toward the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound was coming from, I saw that somebody was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person, like from a faucet. At that moment, I went into like a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, that bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still couldn't get over the shock of that image. That day, the person that was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology was turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during the impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if somebody was still lying in that water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside there. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of the work in the area of the mine where we were all working in. When I looked around, everybody had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area. I said to myself, I'll just rest a little where I'm sitting and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from up ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later, like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching suddenly disappeared. Oh my gosh, where did this man go? I thought. Then I just thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed, but suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for somebody to hit me and run away and me not see them. For this reason, I started running toward the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anybody about what happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming toward me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out, Master, what's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it just kept coming toward me slowly. I felt such a strong sense of fear, and I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming toward me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow. A silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech, not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically. And then he disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I never believed it. 
At that moment, all those stories that I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one to two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they didn't believe me. When I told what had happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam did believe me and said the following. They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die under the rubble are considered martyrs, just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines, mine martyrs. Most probably, that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After my visit to the Imam, and after that day, I never slept in the mine again. When she was just 11 years old, Reddit user SimpleLeaf96396's dad rebuilt their home. However, brand new as it was, it didn't stop something uninvited from checking out her new bedroom. Here's the story. I grew up as an only child. My parents had my sister when I was 11. Before she was born, my dad rebuilt our bungalow into a huge two-story house. Hence, no one had died in my new bedroom. I'm in my mid-twenties now, but when I was around seven, I started getting a lot of nightmares about the concept of death. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end, and then it would stop for a while before starting up again. By the age of 10, this developed into a feeling of being watched, being unable to sleep, and being convinced that something not someone, but something, was watching me from a specific corner of my room. My new room, the one that my dad had built. My dad eventually ripped that section of wall out to show me that there was a space there. I don't remember why, but there was a space all the way around the upstairs. He had tried to turn it into a fun den area for me, but I hated it, and I wouldn't go in there. This continued until I was about 12, when I got my first smartphone. The iPhone was my dad's old one, but it worked just fine. That was until it got dark outside, and the phone would start typing random letters when I was texting or typing to someone. This only ever happened in my bedroom. As soon as I would go out of the room, it stopped. I told my dad, and he said that it must be damaged and he bought me a new one for my 13th birthday. He believes in ghosts, but he couldn't explain what was happening in that room that he had built. The new phone did the same thing. I thought I was going mad. I bought some spell candles from a witchcraft museum when we went on holiday. I was about 14. I used them to politely ask whoever or whatever was there to please leave the house peacefully. This seemed to work, and I was perfectly okay in that room again. I slept fine, my phones were all fine as I upgraded and got new ones, and I moved out when I was 20. I went to visit my parents and stayed the night in my old room. Whatever was there when I was a child is back. That same corner, that same feeling, the same dark energy, the same creature. Except now, I have an image of it, burned into my memory, despite never actually seeing it. It's a dark creature. It has some type of human shape, but very muscular, and it crawls around on all fours, legs bent behind it. Almost wolfish, but without a snout. It snarls and glares, dark red eyes with big black pupils, and it has horns as well. 
big horns curved back over its head. There's some type of red tinge to it, but I can't identify where it comes from. But there you go. That's my story. Believe me or don't, it doesn't matter to me. But I don't go into that room anymore when I see my parents. Not even in the daytime. Redditor Arctic Fox of the North came to the Ghost Stories subreddit to tell not one, but three ghostly tales. Let's hear what happened. So I've wanted somewhere to share my experiences, and figured here was as good as any. My encounters with ghosts have all been pretty short, so far, so I thought I'd just put them all into one story. To this day, I'm convinced that my workplace is haunted. I had my first encounter while at work one evening. It was a little late, and a co-worker and I were staying behind to clean up after the others had left for the day, which is something we regularly do. I was going about my business and cleaning up, but when we were done and heading back to the sluice, my co-worker and best friend noticed that I had a pretty large oil stain in the shape of a handprint on my upper back. At first, I was suspicious of my co-worker, thinking that she had placed her hand on my back, but we later compared her hand to the one that was on my clothing, and her hand was way too small. Thinking back on it, I had never felt anybody put their hand on my back while I was working. That and the stain was so visible that if somebody had actually put their hand on my back, they would have needed to keep it there for a while and while I was moving around. I find this pretty freaky, and I still have no clue where it came from or how it got there. My second and most recent encounter happened two days ago. The weather was pretty bad and the power ended up going out, halting production. The foreman and assistant foreman told us to go wait in the sluice, but it got a bit crowded so we eventually shuffled into the cafeteria. My best friend and I were made to go clean up like usual, but since it was almost pitch black, we couldn't see anything, and thus we only finished off with all the machines the best we could. When we got back into the sluice, we both saw somebody standing by the racks where we would usually hang our work clothes, but when we got around the corner and out from behind one of the shoe racks, there was nobody there. We looked into the foreman's office that's attached to the stairwell, and looked into the other sluice, which is right beside the one we use, but no one was there. The weirdest part is that we both saw two different ghosts. I saw a short and stubby figure, while my best friend saw a tall and lanky one. By far the weirdest experience that I've ever had. But the other one happened a while ago. I was visiting my best friend, and we were watching The Conjuring as you do. She had turned on some candles for some ambiance. Well, while we were watching the movie, one of the candles she lit almost went out, while the other one was standing perfectly still. What I find scary is that the candle only moved whenever something happened on screen. This candle was on a shelf, mind you. I got so creeped out that I eventually just blew out the candle. Something I should note is that my best friend has an attachment, her words, not mine, and now I'm pretty sure something has latched onto me as well. Her house has this old sword that she says has the souls of all of its victims trapped inside, even the original owner of the sword. She's experienced way more spooky things than I have, so I suppose she has more authority on this particular subject. Nevertheless, it's kind of scary even though she always assures me that the ghosts at her home aren't harmful, but they do like to mess around. Somehow, that's less than comforting.
Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear. Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw, but whatever it was, it was no bear. This happened a few months ago, and it's really been bugging me. I was out hiking and rappelling with a friend in the hills area near Tombstone. I want to mention that I have spent quite a bit of time solo hiking and camping. I'm used to hearing noises and brushing it off. Anyway, it's late afternoon, and I'm the first one to rappel down. I got to the bottom, and while my partner was getting ready to follow, we heard this noise that I would describe most like a growl or a snarl. It sounded like it was coming from the ridge above both of us. If facing the cliff, it sounded like it was coming from the right side. We both looked around, but didn't see anything. I encouraged him to come down, and I even half joked that it was probably just a bear or a mountain lion. At that point, I wasn't even feeling that nervous. I figured that once the two of us were together again, we would be pretty intimidating to an animal. While he rappelled down, I heard a loud crash to what seemed to be parallel to me on my left. By this point, I'm starting to get pretty scared, because this sound was getting closer and closer. Somehow, it had gone from right to left, on an exposed cliff face without either of us seeing it. He successfully rappelled down, and we both agreed we needed to get out of there. We still had a steep downhill climb to the car. We packed up the gear as fast as we could. As we get our packs back on, we heard what sounded to me like a howler monkey. The noise was close, and we still couldn't see what was making it. Of course, it was from the direction that we needed to go. We hauled butt down that mountain and got in the car. I know that it can be pretty easy to let the mind play tricks, but we have the exact same account of what happened. Both of us are really familiar with what's out there, and we've never heard anything like it. Now, this is the part that I hesitate to tell, because I know it sounds even more insane. But we both heard whispering and giggling, like it was right next to us, but we still couldn't see anything. 
I keep trying to explain to myself that our minds just played a trick. The same trick, but a trick. The first noise I would chalk up to maybe a bear or a mountain lion. Animals are stealthy. They could run in front of us without us noticing, I guess. Something else could have fallen to the right side. What made that monkey noise, though? I don't know. And why do we both say we heard whispering? I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has creepy experiences in Arizona. I want to believe somebody was just pranking us, but there wasn't a single other car in the parking area. My friend believes that we experienced something supernatural. I honestly have no idea what to think. Reddit user Between the Cold Wires posted a story about something they witnessed. Blink and you'll miss it. This is the story. My apartment overlooks a big freeway. Through my bathroom and kitchen windows, you can see everything on the freeway. I can't tell you how many times I've seen horrific wrecks that have shook my place. When I want to use the restroom, my toilet is right there by the window so you always see what's going on. I came across five cop cars, one wrecker, fire trucks, and two cars. The first car was white, and then about eight feet behind it was another car. The wrecker was in front of everything, and it hadn't even dropped the bed or anything. Normally, I just glance over and feel kind of bad about what I'm seeing and move on. But this time, it was different because it looked like there were a bunch of rescue people on the car, in the back, and there was stuff being pulled out all over the ground. But the cars didn't look wrecked, and normally there aren't that many cop cars unless it's a crime. I can't see that well, because I need my glass to see the small details, and I was curious what they were doing in that car and what was on the ground. Was it a shooting or something? Another weird thing is that I didn't hear any wreck like I normally do. I didn't hear anything at all. I only noticed that all this commotion was happening when I looked out the window. So I thought, I'm going to run out to my car and get my glasses. Because I use them for driving. As I went down, I also passed my kitchen window, and I saw all the red lights flashing. Just a few seconds to go down the stairs, and a few more seconds to my car, got my glasses, came back up, and in a matter of two minutes, everything out that window was gone. There was no evidence of anything, not even debris on the ground. There's no way that one wrecker that didn't even have its bed down to move the two cars was gone that fast. There was no way that all of that stuff was pulled out of the car and somehow put back in completely in two minutes. What the heck just happened? The feeling you get when something like this happens to you is a split second of, did I just lose time? I know I'm not crazy. Did any of this even happen? About 20 years later, I had another experience living by the freeway, with some wrecks, but nothing like this. Still crazy though. What happened was, I heard a wreck, called it in, and they came out. The person was deceased. I watched them clean it all up and then went to bed. 30 minutes later, I heard a wreck, jumped up, looked out my window, and it looked like the exact same wreck. I called that one in too, just in case. I even told them that there was a prior wreck, the exact same way on this location, and I started questioning 911, asking if they had properly cleaned up the area. As I watched the second wreck, it was pretty much identical. The person was deceased in the exact same way. In the morning, I checked out the news, and what happened was that both cars went the wrong way up the ramp at the same location, hours apart, and both were decapitated in the same spot. The ramp appears to have no problems or indications that would have directed people onto it instead of off. I knew then that something really weird had happened that was unexplainable. What's even more messed up? I just checked our city's active incident reports, and it's not on there. I would say to look between 11 and 12 p.m., so I did. 
I looked at the time and date, and it wasn't on there. There's one freeway report, but it's not even in the area that this happened. So it's like both of these things just don't exist. So 30 years ago, I'm about 13 to 14. An older friend and I are babysitting for a six-year-old girl and her younger brother. We had been told that sometimes the girl complains about seeing a ghost man in her bedroom and upstairs at night, and that he comes out through the attic door. Now, I didn't believe a word of it. Kids are weird and they say weird things. We get the kids ready for bed, but they would not settle. The girl said that she felt scared and her little brother started crying. She asked if she could sleep in her mom's bed until she got home and the little brother wanted to go with her. So I tucked them in and I told them some silly stories and I laughed until they were both tired. Both kids were virtually asleep when we left, door ajar, hall light on. An hour later, we're sitting downstairs watching The Equalizer, and all was good. The kids were definitely asleep, as I had to sneak past their room to use the bathroom. I even had a quick peek on my way back. The little brother got a bit of a mini shoot snore going on, but everything else was quiet. Back downstairs, we watched TV a bit more. About 20 minutes go by, and out of nowhere, we hear banging. Heavy, heavy banging. The kids start screaming immediately. I run up the stairs and meet the kids as they're running out of the room. Now before I thought it was the kids, but this time I have my eyes on the kids, so I know that they're not making the sound. And we hear it again. Bang, bang. The kids fly at me. I grab the little brother and we rush down the stairs into the front room, shut all the doors, and all crash onto the sofa. Everything is silent, apart from the TV, which I turn off. We sat in silence for about five minutes, just kind of holding each other. After a few minutes, the little girl, with tears in her eyes, just says in a very matter-of-fact way, The man was angry because I wasn't in my room, so he tried to push over the wardrobe and then started thumping the wall. This event has stayed with me all these years. Our next story is about a woman who experienced a wild glitch in the Matrix. And she wasn't the only witness. Here's her story. If you don't believe in magic or the supernatural, just go to Africa. The stuff you see there is going to change the whole trajectory of your life and everything you thought you knew. I was born and raised in Australia, but when I was 15, I moved to Kenya for four years with my siblings. I just recently came back. I'm 19 now. I have a lot of glitch in the Matrix stories in Kenya, but this one is the most interesting to me. My older brother and sister and I decided to go to the grocery store after school because my grandma, who we were staying with, wanted eggs. We found this outside marketplace type thing where all the food is on tables on the side of the street. We were picking some eggs until everyone near me started screaming. I got scared and I looked where everyone else was looking. They were looking and screaming at an old lady she was just standing still. She looked so normal. Nothing was creepy or scary about her. There were a lot of Muslims in the area of Kenya that I lived in, and they were all shouting Islamic phrases at her, some reading the Quran. It was such a scene. Then, as I was watching her, she disappeared. I can swear on all the heavens and gods above that I am not lying. This woman disappeared on the spot just gone. 
The moment she vanished, everyone started screaming even more. My brother tells me this is all very normal in Kenya, and people believe that women like her are demons, and that's why they were yelling at her to leave. I don't care what it was, but she vanished on the spot. No walking away, nothing to block my view of her, just vanished. My brother and sister saw, the cashier lady at the food place saw, a lot of people saw this. We ran home and told my grandma, and she goes, oh yeah, that's normal here. What? I said. She said that it was people who use black magic to get around, and to never interfere with them. I'll never forget what that woman looked like, or how my body reacted when I saw her vanish. But along with my other experiences, I know for a fact that the supernatural, magic, and other things exist in our world. So this happened a few months ago. I was babysitting my baby brother late at night. I'd say around 11 o'clock. I have a video baby monitor with me almost all the time, apart from this one time where I left it in my room while I went to grab a drink downstairs. While downstairs, I heard a loud crash coming from my parents' room, where he sleeps as he's quite young. I also hear him crying. Obviously panicked, I rush up the stairs, and I find that my brother is sleeping soundly but my parents' TV is on the floor, and the screen is cracked. I put it back up and just hoped that my mom would believe me that I had no idea how it had fallen. Considering that it's quite heavy and on a stable surface, and the cats can't even knock it over, I was quite confused. Go forward a couple of minutes and I'm in my room, just relieved that my brother is safe. But I feel this constant negative energy anxiety just filled me and I could feel eyes on me but I knew that no one was home soon after my parents return I tell my mom what happened she checked my brother and the TV she calls me in and says what crack I walked in to find that the TV was completely fine I still can't explain what happened Some of my friends and I ventured into an old abandoned hospital that's pretty securely boarded up. We climbed through a broken window that was maybe eight inches at most. It was nighttime and most of the large hospital campus is abandoned, with welded doors and boarded windows. And though people had obviously gotten in before us, there was much less graffiti and damage than we're used to seeing in these places. The campus has several buildings and we were clueless as to which one we were in, until we found a morgue in the basement and medical equipment strewn about. We didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary, except for the light in the attic. The building had no power, yet we could see from the top floor that a light was on above us. We couldn't get into the attic, as the only staircase up there had a chained and bolted door it was a little odd, but I'm not sure if it was paranormal. I suppose it could have been a solar-powered light, but why? Would the bulb ever go out? It didn't scare us off, we did continue wandering around for a while, and like I said, nothing crazy happened. But it's still very strange to me that there was a light on in a powerless attic. My parents own a sprawling three-story manor built in 1912. This house has a finished bedroom in the attic, which is mildly weird on its own. 
But when I turned 14 and was going into high school, I begged them to empty the junk out and let me live there. I thought it would be totally awesome, like having an apartment away from the rest of my family. They agreed I could do it and I got to paint it and put in new carpet and fill it with the furniture that I picked out. All vintage because that's what I like. The place was awesome, but the door didn't quite fit into the jam anymore, so it would swing open on its own. I was not cool with having the door open to the rest of the attic in the middle of the night. I shut the door as tightly as it would go, and before bed, I jammed it shut with my desk chair. I mean, I really wedged it in there. I had my sister test, and the door would not budge from the attic side. Cool. I went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up feeling refreshed, until I noticed that the desk chair was tucked back under the desk. The door was shoved all the way open, so hard that it had actually dented the wall and I had no explanation. To this day, all present family members swear they didn't do it, and I think I would have had to have heard them anyhow. I decided the ghosts in the attic didn't like me shutting them out. For the duration of my time living in the attic, several years, I left the door open, and nothing else really happened, so I guess all they wanted was some freedom. Still, definitely freaked me out. For our next tale, Reddit user that goth witch one recounts the story of a Ouija board session gone wrong. Here's what happened. Roughly eight years ago, during spooky season, I was staying with my boyfriend's mom and her baby daddy at the baby daddy's house. My boyfriend was away in another town, visiting his grandmother and friends. My boyfriend's mom and his two sisters and I were watching a scary movie. When we somehow ended up in a conversation about how the house that we were in had a history of being haunted. 15-year-old me absolutely loved the occult and witchcraft, especially Ouija boards at the time. You see where this is going, right? I proposed the idea of making and using one. Stupid idea, I know. And everybody was all up in arms for a spooky October evening. I don't remember what the session consisted of regarding questions or answers, but there's a very good reason for that. About 15 minutes into our session, we get to talking about our creepy experiences. A woman's blood-curdling scream erupted from the downstairs basement, echoing up the stairs to the living room where we were. The baby daddy was asleep, mind you, and even if he hadn't been, there was no way in heck that he could have produced such a terrifying noise. Not a chance. This scream was not a regular scream. It sounded like a few different things. In one way, it sounded like a woman was being brutally stabbed to death and was in excruciating pain. In another way, it almost sounded otherworldly, straight up demonic. It reminded me of what I would imagine a banshee to sound like if I'd ever heard one. We all panicked. All four of us heard it. It sounded so clearly like a physical person so much so that we were scared that somebody was really down there, so the mom went down to make sure that there wasn't, and there wasn't. We said goodbye and ended the session. To this day, I'm still unsure if it was a lost spirit calling for help, or if it was a dark entity making its presence known. This is my dad's experience. My dad grew up in Indonesia, and he told me about this time that he and a friend were traveling to another province for work. It took a day or so to get there, and after driving their van all day, they needed to spend the night somewhere. They stopped at some kind of local inn, 
and asked how much it would be for the night. The owner said that it was much cheaper that day of the week and asked if they were sure that they wanted to stay there that night. This was because previous guests had said that on that day of the week, they would hear banging on the doors and loud footsteps walking toward the bed they were sleeping in. Well, my dad and his friend didn't believe in ghosts or anything, so they decided to stay the night because it was cheap and better than spending a night in the van. As they started to go to sleep, it was all quiet for a couple of hours until they heard banging on the door, which woke them up. My dad and his friend immediately thought that the staff were playing a prank, so they checked the door, but nobody was there. They were a little bit spooked, but they tried going back to sleep. After about 20 minutes or so, they heard the door handle rattle, and then they heard the locked door open. Both of them were frozen and hid their faces under their sheets. They then heard heavy footsteps, like somebody was wearing boots, walking closer to the bed. Neither of them wanted to look, but my dad decided to rip the sheet off and see what it was. He told me that when he ripped the sheets off, he glanced what was there. It was a figure of a man, maybe in his early 40s, wearing extremely dirty clothing and boots. The man's face was extremely pale, and he just stared at my dad. My dad tried to scream, but he couldn't, and eventually his friend had a look at the figure. They were both just speechless. After a few moments, all they could really do was cover their faces. They went back under their sheets, and when they did, they heard the door slam, but no footsteps leading up to it. After a couple of minutes, they checked to see if it was still there, but it was gone. They immediately grabbed their backpacks and left the place and just kept driving. After that incident, my dad is a very strong believer in ghosts. For this next story, Reddit user PrestigiousNeck873 recounts their mom's tale about a rather heartwarming paranormal encounter. Here's her story. My grandma unfortunately passed away around five years ago. She was living here with my grandpa, and they were both on my mom's side. Unfortunately, again yesterday, my grandfather passed. What makes this a ghost story, though, is what happened twice the night before their passing. The night after my grandma passed, my mom had a very vivid dream that she told us about. The dream started with my grandma coming out of her room. My mom was in tears asking her, Mom, are you okay? And grandma reassured her multiple times, Don't worry, don't worry, I'm fine. My mom looks down and notices that my grandma's oxygen tank wasn't plugged in. She wasn't connected to it. My mom had said, Mom, your oxygen. My grandma just looked at her endearingly and said, Oh, I don't need that thing anymore. And then my mom woke up. Fast forwarding to more recently, my grandpa has been very sick. He gave up on his health and took very poor care of himself and wouldn't accept any help. He often said that he wanted to die. My mom tried so hard to get him to change his life and go to a hospital, but he wouldn't go or take any medicine. One day, we heard nothing coming from his room. We could usually hear a TV on, him coughing once in a while, but there was just nothing. At that point, he was gone, but we didn't know that yet. That night, she had another dream, but this time with my grandpa. He walked out of his room and made his way to the restroom, and Mom asked, Oh my gosh, are you okay? We hadn't heard from you. He smiled and looked at her and said, Yes, don't worry. We're okay now. My mom described him clearly smiling with tears in his eyes. She woke up the next day, ran into the room, and found him passed away. 
What makes it crazier is that both dreams happened the night of the day that they passed away, even though my mom hadn't known yet that they were gone. May they rest in peace. I am a 20-year-old male, and my buddies and I enjoy late-night walks on the trails within the various conservation areas in my region. We live in southwestern Ontario. Late last week, we decided to check out an area called Pleasant Valley. To my knowledge, this area has a deeply rooted history with the Underground Railroad, Indigenous people, as well as the War of 1812. If I'm not mistaken, it's because of its proximity to Lake Erie. At least that's what I've heard. We entered the woods at about 2 a.m. and immediately upon entering, I was overcome with a bad feeling. After walking for some time, the feeling progressively worsened until we reached two bent trees in an X over the path. One of my buddies pointed out the fact that it was quote, bad juju to go underneath and we should just call it a night. We all felt watched, so we thought it was probably a good idea. As soon as we turn around and start to head back, the entire forest seemed dramatically quieter. We all hear a loud, distinctively human whistle behind us, almost like how you would call a dog over. There's no way that anybody could have been out there at that hour. There's no homes in close enough proximity for someone to just be out and about. We all ran and I was honestly terrified my friends and I are all relatively big guys and we're pretty comfortable in the woods, so it takes a lot to get us running. There was also this faint unpleasant odor, kind of like rotting eggs as we left the forest, and it wasn't present when we initially entered. I don't know if that's related, but we just noticed it. Either way, weird night. A few years ago, I was camping in the Serengeti as part of a safari I was doing. We had set up our tents in a designated camping area with a bathroom building. I'm from the States and had been camping and backpacking tons of times, but the Serengeti felt different. We could hear baboons from our tents for one. In the middle of the night, I had to pee, so I carefully unzipped my tent and started walking through the grass toward the bathrooms. Already, I was feeling a little jumpy. When I creaked open the bathroom door, a crap ton of bats flew over my head and out of the building. It felt like that scene in Batman Begins where young Bruce Wayne fell into the cave. I was just really hoping that nothing else was in the bathroom. It just felt really eerie. It ended up all right, but I was very glad to get back to my tent. On a separate trip, I was hiking through southern Ethiopia with a guide to a lake where we would be able to take a boat and see some hippos. It was quiet for the most part, but a portion of our hike took us through some brush and trees, and we started hearing this loud, gruesome moaning, and the whole forest felt still. We looked and looked to find out what was making the sound, and that's when we saw a massive baboon lying face down on the ground, dying. We gathered from its position that it must have fallen from a tree and seriously injured itself and was now crying out in pain. Obviously, we kept our distance because we didn't know how it would react or if any other animals would be nearby. The noise it made was both heartbreaking and terrifying. It had an almost spiritual quality to it. We moved on shortly after but I'll forever remember how I felt watching this animal die alone in the forest. Honestly, it was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. So I'm stargazing with my wife 
and we're both in an extreme state of unease. We both look at each other and we say, something isn't right here. I'm looking into the pines, looking for the reason of our fear, and I see this orange cat sitting on a stump. The way it looked at me scared me, but I didn't really focus much on the cat. Suddenly through the trees, we hear this screaming. Help me, please, anyone out here? It sounded like a little girl at first, but then it sounded like a grown woman. Somebody effing help me. It cut through my body. I have never been that fearful in my entire life. I was completely terrified. My wife yells out, where are you? You're not alone. No reply. We get into our pathfinder, roll the windows down, and we have spotlights out each side searching for this woman. A couple more screams let out into the still night. She sounds like she's within 10 feet, but there's nobody around. We yell out to try to let her know that we're there, but we never get a reply. A scream so loud then happens, and it leaves my eardrums ringing. Somebody please help me. It's like she's screaming directly into the car, but no one is anywhere. This scream was different because it sounded fearful, but also angry, and it really genuinely hurt my ears. That was the last one. We kept searching, but not another peep. Her voice was just not natural. I don't even know how to explain it. I am haunted by this experience, and honestly, I'm just looking for answers on what that was. I get chills when I talk about it. It almost makes me teary-eyed. This is probably completely unrelated, but in the same stretch of woods the day before, I was hiking and I came across an owl. I thought it was a decoy, like a prop or something, until it turned its head around and gazed deep into my eyes. I froze. I wasn't exactly fearful, but it had a strange effect on me. Its eyes were orange, bright, almost glowing. We locked eyes for what seemed like minutes, and then it flew off without a sound. 